Thanks, Jessica. Okay, thank you everyone for coming today to the uh, Early Learning Advisory Council special meeting. We're working on uh, report development for the Fair Starts for Kids Act uh, spending goals and strategies recommendations. Um, just, I know you guys are very familiar with Zoom meetings and our virtual protocols, but just remember to mute yourself if you have a lot of background noise. Um, if you have a webcam on that is showing to other participants. Um, we have a small enough group here today and want this to be casual. So feel free to just either raise your hand or unmute and jump in whenever you have a question or something that you would like to share. And for introductions today, um, we can, we have it in the chat. Should we do it in the chat or out loud, Eric? What do you think? We could do it out loud. I was going to say we have kind of a smaller group. So yeah. um, feel free to share in the chat if you uh, are not able to unmute and share out loud uh, for some reason right now. But either share in the chat or we'll start, we will call on people to share your name, your role, and what excites you most about the Fair Start for Kids Act. So the first person I see on my screen is Val. Good morning. I'm Val Arnold. And I'm representing, um, I'm serving as an ESIT state representative on, on ELAC. Um, and there's a lot that excites me about the Fair Start for Kids Act. But um, if I was gonna pick what probably excites me the most is the um, versatility or mm -hmm. um, maybe diversity is another term in terms of, um, the the options that that are available in terms of of how how the funds can be used and the inclusivity in how those types of decisions um, are are happening. So that's what excites me the most. Thank you, Val. Danielle. Hi, I would say for me it's um the way that it's allowed family, more families to be eligible for, for programming, for subsidy. Um, I'm a ECAP, early ECAP child care and Eclipse um, center director. And uh, we've seen increase in eligibility for families that maybe in the past have been private pay for us, uh, but now are able to qualify for ECAP. So that for me is the most exciting is just the openness for eligibility and more families being eligible because of the requirements changing. Thank you, Danielle. Um, I see we have an intro in the chat. Hi, I'm Milan Moulier, a pedi pediatrician, and I work at Eastgate Public Health Clinic in Bellevue. I'm currently in a shared office space, so cannot unmute my mic, too much background, and I'm looking forward to improving access to child care for all the families I serve. Um, and is it Milan or Milan? I guess you can't unmute right now, so I will ask you that when you are able to unmute. But definitely, if I say anybody's name wrong, please correct me. I want to get it right. Um, next, I see Astrid. Good morning, everyone. I'm Astrid Newell. I am the representative from the Washington State Department of Health. And um, let's see, what excites me most? I think I'm um, really excited about the potential for improving child, family, and uh, and, and provider well-being. I think there's, a, you know, over the long run, um, big picture, I'm excited about, about the investments that uh, can contribute to well-being. So that's what I'm excited about. Thanks, Astrid. And Michelle also did her introduction in the chat. Michelle Perez, Workforce Equity Learning Partner, the intentionality behind using multiple methods to make childcare more accessible. Thank you, Michelle. And Mary, I see you next. Hi, um, I'm Mary Rulowitz from Timberland Regional Library. I'm the early learning coordinator for the, for the district. Um, so this is all, very, very new to me. I am um, an enthusiastic um, observer right now and a learner. I'm thrilled that the Fair Start for Kids Act exists. Um, and I'll be really curious to see just um, how much impact it can have on families and definitely childcare workers. It's, you know, when, when they're supported and cared for, I think that can only help um, 
you know, make their jobs easier and in the long run, the children will benefit. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mary. I agree. We got some more coming in in the chat. Let me scroll back. Kathy Carmen, child care center seat, the possibility of improving the current child care crisis. Claudette Lindquist, investing in children, executive committee chair. I am excited to empower the voices of early learning. Um, and Dre Carrillo, I work in equity at I work in equity and education coalition as the programs manager. I'm also excited about more children getting an early learning education. Maya Ewings, uh, WCFC Pathways Policy Advocacy Fellow. I am most excited about more families being able to work with access to affordable care. I have lots of background noise as well. Jamie McLaughlin, Bright Sparks Early Learning Services Mobilization Coordinator. And Jamie is excited to see how this act supports improving access for families. Thank you to those who entered in the chat. And Jen Sandvig, I see you next. Uh, good morning. I'm Jen Sandvig. I represent Washington Federation of Independent Schools. And I am most excited about how um, the independent school community can take a more active role in um, early childhood education uh, and uh, hopefully get more of our programs um, accepting subsidy to serve more families. Thank you. Olivia Burley. Hi, I'm Olivia Burley. I'm the military spouse liaison for the state of Washington. And um, in my role, I advocate for military families to have access to affordable and quality childcare, um, which is an issue for civilian families and also for military families in Washington. And I'm excited about the Fair Start for Kids Act because I think that um, the, the work of this act will make more childcare affordable and also advocate for our providers. Thank you, Olivia. Colleen? Good morning, my name is Colleen Condon. Um, I am a childcare provider and my role here today is as a, a regional lead for Early Learning Coalition, uh, the Inland Northwest Early Learning Alliance. Um, and I am most excited about uh, the cost of care model tool um, and getting away from um, the practice of using a market rate survey, um, having an actual tool that we can put in uh, cost factors will be huge towards setting subsidy rates that are realistic for providers to be able to function with. Um, so I'm excited for that transition away from a, a bad practice. Great, thank you, Colleen. Um, a couple more in the chat. Trinity Gorbanova, program coordinator for JSOL Studios. I'm most excited about families having more ease and gaining access to early learning. And then Susan Brown, member of the public and child care provider, excited about the licensing improvements to come based on the FSKA recommendations report. And then a couple, oh yeah, more in the chat or more in um, the window. Lois, I see you next. Hi, good morning, everyone. Lois Martin, I'm director owner of Community Day Center for Children and the ELAC, one of the ELAC co-chairs. Um, for me, it's I'm hopeful that more funds will be put into the expansion of community-based training um, to make it more accessible to center staff um, and expand it beyond um, family home providers so that it's easier for the field for those who may find it challenging to go back to a community college to be able to meet these um, state uh, enforced requirements. Great, thank you, Lois. Danny Hoffman? Um, yeah, Danny Hoffman, and I'm a disabilities consultant for Puget Sound Educational Services District, and we support Head Start and ECAP uh, children across King and Pierce counties. Um, I think I'm most excited about the complex needs funds that are included um, in the Fair Start for Kids Act, mostly because um, children with disabilities are a prioritized population in ECAP. Um, but beyond them being prioritized in those populations, there's not a lot of support for staff. 
um, to receive supporting those children who may have additional needs. And so I'm excited to hear more about those complex needs funds and figuring out how they can be used to really support teachers and children in meaningful ways. Thank you. And Enrica? Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Enrica Hampton. I um, serve as the uh, regional advisor for the King County Early Learning Coalition. Um, I'm excited to see how this act supports um, improving access for families and supporting providers um, to meet the needs of um, children with uh, disabilities. Thank you, Enrica. Heidi Scott? Hello, I just jumped on. Okay, There's sorry. Introductions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so my name is Heidi Scott. Um, the role I'm holding right now is um, I'm representing the PEC, um, PECC Peninsula's uh, coalition and um, as their uh, policy and advocacy co-lead. Um, what excites me most for the Fair Start for Kids Act, um, I just think increasing accessibility um, to those who are in the kind of the middle ranges for uh, WCC. See, WCCC. <laughs> Thanks, Heidi. Wendy? Hi, good morning. Um, Katz Mewe just hopped on. Um, my name is Wendy Thomas. I'm the Tribal Early Learning Liaison with DCYF Office of Tribal Relations. And um, there are several things about the Fair Start for Kids Act that I can appreciate. Um, as the person in front of me just said, is increasing eligibility for um, for all children, and um, and then also hopefully expanding the definition of Indian child through ECAP program again to expand um, eligibility for troubled children. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. And then I see somebody on the phone with their phone number beginning in two o six and ending in eight one eight. Would you like to introduce yourself? If you press star six, it may unmute you. I know sometimes if you're on the phone, you're probably driving or doing something, but I just want to give you the opportunity. Okay, did I miss anybody? Well, I guess we can do our introductions for staff as well. Uh, my name is Emily Morgan. I use she, her pronouns, and I am on the community engagement team with DCYF. Uh, my title is community engagement management analyst. Um, and what excites me most about the Fair Start for Kids Act Professionally, I would say the uh, expanding language access. I'm pretty interested in how we can, how DCYF can help support language access. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. And personally, I'm interested in how uh, I have a 10 month old. So how FSKA will um, trickle down to help increasing access to people who need infant and toddler care. Um, and Eric, would you like to go next? Yes, I would. Hi, everyone. My name is Eric LaFontaine. I am a community engagement manager on the DCYF team, along with Emily. And what excites me the most about the Fair Start for Kids Act is the foundation that it has begun laying uh, to uh, allow the child care sector and DCYF and, and all those involved in all this great work to really build on something now um, that, that has a, a real fresh start and the, the opportunity to continue to grow and grow and adapt and meet all the needs, hopefully, of all these um, thousands of child care providers and, um, and even children and families. So it, it excites me that there is a, a, a bright future ahead for this legislation and then um, most of the, uh, the opportunity ahead. That's it. I think maybe Jess is hiding in there somewhere. Jess, are you in there somewhere? Yeah. Morning, everybody. Jessica Spencer, I'm a specialist on the community engagement team. And um, basically what everyone else has said, just excited about the expanded access and affordability for the, the kids. Thanks, Jessica. Did we miss anybody or did anyone jump on while we were doing those last few? Hi, my name is Debbie Carlson. 
Um, I am the Snohomish County Early Learning Coordinator and also Regional Advisor um, in the Northwest area. And I am really just want to um, uh, just acknowledge all the things that have already been said. I'm just in general excited about the increased access um, to uh, early learning opportunities for families. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. And before we get started, I know this might be some some of your first meeting um, with the special meeting report development. So just a little clarification, this meeting is open to the public and the purpose of this meeting is to work on the um, Fair Start for Kids Act recommendation, spending goals and strategies recommendation report. Um, this report is called out in the Fair Start for Kids Act legislation, um, asking ELAC to work with DCYF to develop this report. So it is open to the public as well. Um, and that was something that you all wanted. You wanted uh, as much feedback as possible from the public. So we, uh, these are open to the public and, and that is the purpose of this meeting. Um, and before we dive in any further, does anybody have any questions about that? If this is your first meeting or even if it's not. Okay, great. Um, I think we'll start with looking at some of the survey results um, we've received so far. So this survey will, will be open, I think until the 26th of July is the deadline, um, but we have received at least 27 responses as of yesterday at about 10 a.m. So we can kind of start with going through those and Eric is sharing his screen. So Eric, if you kind of want to lead us, yes, thank you. You bet, absolutely. I will take the reins from here. Um, okay. so. As you all know, we, we had a chance to send out a um, fairly robust quantitative survey, um, I think a month or so ago, and, and we did have the opportunity to not only include ELAC, uh, but others involved in um, within the group. So I think that include provider supports and PAG. And what we've got is a ton of data. We really do. We have a lot of response into this survey that um, I think will allow us and you all as a group to to really kind of again kind of move this opportunity forward and um, most effectively by being able to say hey DCYF this is what we think this is what we think should be done this is how it's affected us and I think some of this reflects that so uh, a lot of the results from this survey will allow us to move a little more thoroughly into the actual recommendation report itself, which you all have seen, hopefully, and then we'll be talking about that on the uh, back half of this conversation. Um, yeah, Susan, looks like you have a hand raised. Go for it. Yeah, I just was wondering, um, is the number of responses st statistically relevant and have meaning based on the number of people who received the survey who may not? Oh, right. No, that's a great question. Um, no, I, I don't think there were there, there were any sort of records set with the number of responses, right? Based on the number that that were asked to participate. Um, what I see here is that you know there were twenty seven thirty plus really engaged individuals, and we haven't seen that a lot in surveys. You know, so when I kind of say we have really good data here. Um, I guess I'm kind of comparing it to maybe other survey monkeys we've inundated you all with in the past mm -hmm. and then asked lots of different questions, right? But but this particular survey looks to have some some really good involvement and engagement in it. So thank you, Susan. That's a great question. Yeah. So my follow-up to that though, then Eric, is I'm wondering if I I mean, and maybe there are others on this call who have a better answer, but I think we need more engagement than 27 people. And if 27 is great compared to other surveys, I'm wondering why the question wasn't asked, what do we need to do to get more engagement than, than less than 27? So I think before I would be able to sign off on this is a great response, I think we need to assess whether more attempts at gathering the data should be taken and what should those methods be? So that's my feedback. Yeah, I can jump in real quick. Um, yeah, go for it. 
So this was sent out. Uh, I just want to make sure you guys know how it was sent out. So if you have feedback on any more places we can reach out to, we will gladly do that. We send it to our parent advisory group, our um, outdoor, oh, I'm going to mess up this acronym, the outdoor learning group. Nature-based. On back. Yeah, outdoor yeah. nature-based advisory group our provider support subcommittee of ELAC. It was obviously sent to ELAC as well. So you guys, um, we shared it to the Facebook page, DCYF's Facebook page. Um, and it also went out uh, on our Gov delivery system, which has like 4,000 respondents. But I know that, that it comes in as, this is a message from the Washington State Gov delivery system. So we don't always see a ton of feedback from that route. We also shared it with, uh, let me pull up my list. Several organizations that ELAC asked us to share it with at the May report development session. Um, it'll take me a second to find that list, so I'll actually put it in in the chat. Um, but we are definitely open to any any other ways you guys would like us to send out the survey, and we also definitely encourage you to send this survey out to your own networks as well. Yeah, I think my my concern is that you know if you if there have been lack of response in the past, it might be. I, I mean, there's a reason for that. So it's like you know the definition right. of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different right. result, and that's kind of what this feels like is we're doing the same thing over and over again and not mm -hmm. getting the results we want. So I'm just curious if if there's conversations like even with. I mean, maybe it needs to be handled differently than it is being handled, and maybe it has to actually literally be in, I don't know what the answer is, but it concerns me that only 27 responses, and I'll admit, I, I mean, I'm frustrated by all these things, and I feel like we're, we're always chasing our tail, we're never getting anywhere, or, or not making the, the leaps and forward that I'd like to see, so, but anyway, yeah. I just am concerned that, that, um, there the, that the lack of participation isn't because you're using all these lists there's a reason for it and finding out what that reason is and then how right. do we get more engagement that's that's what i think we need to do yeah you actually bring up a really good point um susan and on i guess a related note we we are community engagement as when i say we um we are starting to work with or beginning to look work with a, a consultant and and what we're going to be doing in terms of bringing you know some some additional eyes on community engagement is we're going to find out why that is right we're we're going to be working with you all in um in really understanding what it is we can be doing differently and and I'm talking community engagement right not necessarily DCYF but of course this all funnels to DCYF um so Susan great point that that maybe there is something more there as to why that many aren't engaging. Um, but we do have plans, though, in place currently right now that are going to be looking at that specific question. So a little more to come there. Sure. OK, well, thank you. So then well, I guess what I would suggest that at this point is this is interesting data, but hopefully it's not going to be used to inform decisions because it's such a small sample of providers responding. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, actually, this it, this particular data is really just internal, right? for for us at this at this moment. Um, it's really the recommendation report itself that you all have complete control over in terms of what recommendations are made, right? Yeah. Um, that's what we'll make sure is uh, you know the the focal point of this. This just kind of becomes a background, and I think it, it helps us DCYF kind of see, okay, well, the satisfaction maybe that we we thought was there isn't as high as we would like it to be. And, you know, why is that? What can we do differently? Um, you know, how can we start working with you all in a, in a different capacity? So I hope that helps clarify a little bit. It helps some, um, Eric. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. And this survey, um, as Eric said, it's internal. It is for you guys to help you inform your recommendation report. So yes. I, this survey data will not be used to say like, this is how the community feels about this. This is just right. to help inform you guys for your report. You guys asked, asked for us to send out the survey to help inform your report. So just to clarify, we're not like sending this to any any departments to say like, hey, here is what they want. Right, yeah. This is just for us, oh, for you, for you all. Yeah. Uh, Val, looks like you have your hand raised. 
Thanks, Eric. This is Val. I just wanted to offer a reflection and I apologize. You may have this somewhere in our materials, but um, in our ESA world, we also are engaged in um, uh, conducting a parent survey annually as a part of our federal accountability reporting. And I just wanna reflect that some of the things that I've learned as well as, um, as was shared earlier in the importance of looking at um, the, the number of responses in surveys, we may also want to um, look at the representativeness of those responding as well, that that can be as equally as important as the number of surveys that, that we get. And I'm just speaking in general about surveys. So I don't know if you have, I haven't had a chance to go all the way through. You may have information about representativeness of the respondents, but just, just a thought, just wondering. Yeah, no, that that's a um, that's a really good point to raise. You know, I I don't know if we could necessarily categorize the responses into you know who responded a particular way. Um, I think we kind of built it that way on purpose to give it a um, you know the anim the anonymity feel of of that way. Everyone, you all could come in and just kind of say how you felt. And, and didn't need to feel like that you were necessarily putting your name on that. Um, I think a lot of you are totally comfortable with putting your name on it because you do in, in meetings and you tell us all the time. So um, I, I, let's, we'll look at the data, maybe look at if we can, I, maybe identify where the links, the clicks came from. That might be something that we could do. Like, for example, from the PAG meeting, we may be able to identify from that email who clicked on it and went to the survey, and then that could help us identify. We a will not. Bit, so. We gave everyone we the not. same. We won't. We gave oh, everyone we okay. the same link. But that I think that's a good point for us to consider moving forward. We did. We ask, can do that next time. Yeah, we did ask for if anybody was willing to have a further conversation about their responses, so we could get a little more qualitative data. So we would have some. We could get some demographics from from that portion of the survey respondents, but. Um, that's a great call out. We did not ask for any demographic or even like, are you a parent, a provider? Uh, we didn't ask those, that those questions were not included on this survey. And, and that, that's okay. I think it's, I think it's amazing that you've got a yes to question one, that you've got folks who, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in a follow-up interview. That's great. Yeah, which is a great segue into the very beginning of the, of the actual survey here. Um, that, you know, this, I know one piece that you all wanted to be different in this recommendation was report was you wanted to have the voice of, of you all reflected, not just a sentence or two or a recommendation that, you know, you wanted to be able to reflect how Fair Start for Kids Act and the many moving parts of it have actually affected your, um, your, your centers and your children and your families. And, and so we asked who would be willing to, to, talk a little more about that experience. And we have around 13 of you that have said, yes, I would love to, to say, um, you know, give a little more feedback, a little more context to that. Um, I think Emily and I, right before this, we were chatting a bit on how we would necessarily um, move through that. And I'm wondering, since we have you all here, uh, do you have any recommendations on how now we can take, you know, these 13, 14 individuals that have said, yes, I'd like to talk more about this. Um, what would maybe be the best way to engage with you a little further? Or does anyone have any suggestions? Might be helpful if we share. Our, our plan was basically just to reach out to these people and, um, and ask if we could set up a Zoom interview and interview is not maybe the right word, a Zoom meeting for them just to kind of share more about what the survey prompted uh, for them. So if there's any more specific um, advice or any other specific way you guys would like us to do that, we are definitely open to that. So you all will be hearing from us. Um, and Emily, would you be able to take this next slide real quickly? I can need to step away for a quick sec. Thank you. Okay, so I wonder if I can actually. You want me to unshare mine? Um, yeah, maybe, yeah. Yeah, that might be easier so we can scroll through. 
Um, I know Jessica, I didn't ask you to prepare it, but do you do you have the survey data pulled up? Yeah, one second. Okay, thank you so much. So what we'll kind of do here is we'll just scroll through the, the survey data. We sent it to you guys, but it's hefty. So uh, I know that you probably didn't have time to actually go through it, but mostly just looking at the, okay, so we can go to the next one and keep going. Yeah, okay. right on that one. There you go. I'm back. Oh, thank you. Okay, excellent. Well, I'll just let you, Emily, um, is it Emily or Jess, are you screen sharing? Either or I'll let you guys take the controls from here. Uh, so we asked, how satisfied were you with the progress of this spending goal and strategy, which was expanding health care coverage through state sponsorship of child care workers? Um, I don't know if I necessarily need to read all of this. Maybe um, I can agree, give you all the opportunity to, to kind of read this to yourself, unless you'd all like me to read each of these through. I can. Okay, perfect. Well, I think you would not want me to read through then it sounds like. Um, what this particular response out of 18, um, it looks like about half of you feel comfortable with where we're at. Um, again, you know, that's a good start. Uh, I think that 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 gave us a reflection of, um, you know, with that, with expanding healthcare coverage on where you all were fill, fitting in. Um, as I mentioned before, the recommendation report itself is gonna be where most of this is. This is just reference. This is just to kind of give you all an idea of how you're all feeling collectively. Um, and then that will of course allow us to dive a little further. Um, Jess, if you wanna go down to the next one. Perfect, thank you, Val. Okay, so how about the shorter ones I can read? Um, increasing child care and early, learn to provide, early learning providers compensation. How satisfied are you with the progress of the spending strategy? Uh, it doesn't appear there's a whole lot of satisfaction and I would love to open this up to the room. And um, for those of you maybe that answered or didn't have a chance to answer, maybe you could expand a little bit on why you answered that way. Also, if we can scroll down to the, um... Oh, it's at the very end, isn't it? Uh, sorry, Eric. I wonder if we, so there's some, we asked, we also asked in the survey for, you know, can you share more? So um, maybe we go through the, the, the numbers first and then go down to the bottom for the, uh, the comment, the comment section, and then we can oh, yeah. open it up because that might prompt some things if, if they can see what, what other people said. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that works. Yeah. Um, how about Jess, do you mind if I take the controls back? Thank you, so kind, thank you so much. Okay, everybody, here we are. Um, okay, uh, increase in childcare and early learning providers compensation. Um, how satisfied were you? Uh, an average of three out of 10 was the satisfaction rating for that particular question. Looking at question five, implementing the provisions of collective bargaining agreements for Family child care providers negotiated pursuant to RCW 41.56.028. How satisfied are you with this, the progress of this spending goal strategy? Um, about the same, a little less, a little under uh, maybe a 2.8 average or so of satisfaction. Looking at question six, uh, your satisfaction with the progress of providing resources and supports for FFN caregivers that better reflect the full cost of care. Um, again, it kind of reflects that I think you're where you all are feeling about this particular topic. Uh, we're about maybe a two and a half, two point four or so. Question seven: Providing professional development opportunities and supporting the substitute pool for childcare and early learning providers. Examples would be community-based training increasing scholarships. And your satisfaction with the progress of this spending goal strategy is uh, still fairly low, um, about a, a, a little over an average of three out of 10. And if anyone has anything they'd like further clarification or to talk about, then please raise your hand and we can definitely spend some time on, on that. Um, or at the end, I think we'll, we'll be able to dive a little deeper as Emily mentioned. And question eight, providing access to 
Learning technology, how satisfied are you with the progress of this spending goal strategy? Um, just under three on a scale of 10. Providing incentives and supports for child care providers to become licensed. Collectively, uh, you can see the, the satisfaction with that spending goal strategy isn't, isn't real high. Question 10, how many questions are there? A lot, okay. <laughs> uh, recognizing the benefits of the diverse workforce and facilitating communication in the three most commonly spoken languages by developing a language access plan that centers on equity and access for immigrants, multilingual providers, caregivers, and families. An example would be increasing availability of resources in multiple languages. Uh, we asked how are you we asked how satisfied you are with the progress and collectively out of 19 respondents we came in about a four out of 10. Do you feel like this collection of activities is on track to meet this policy objective? 17 of you answered and it looks like a little over majority said no. Um, I think we'll have a chance to get into what's missing here shortly. Oh, in the comment fields, maybe this would be a good time to reflect a bit on some of these these responses here. Um, in one of the first comments, it's on track in theory, but I am eager to see how implementation plays out. How does this act plan to increase compensation for workers, for example? Will these benefits and ideas actually come to fruition? Another second comment. Fiscal incentives and training opportunities for informal home care providers. Third comment, yes, but it was not well thought out and many providers were not able to receive incentives, scholarships, et cetera, due to lateness of rollout and not in all languages in goal in a timely manner. Have not seen or heard of any clear pathways to support the above work. I am unaware of many of these initiatives despite working for a licensed preschool program for the past two years. I marked five for any that I have heard or seen anything about and one for those that seem great, but I have no understanding of what is being done to further the goals. I marked zero for initiatives that do not pertain to the type of child care program I have been working in. Thank you for that comment. That was nice to, to hear some of your, your thought rationale of how you were scoring these. DCYF is irresponsible, mismanaged, harmful, and giving money to imagine for a pretend sub pool. The department is spending all its energy gatekeeping funding. In rural Washington, we have seen zero benefits so far. This has done nothing to help us. Much more is needed as far as language supports and funding that covers the actual costs of providing childcare and early learning services. I do believe work is being done. I believe a lot of funding is spent on thinkers and not on doers. I also believe that all websites should have a caret button to drop down and change the language. Love that suggestion. I don't think this is much to ask for. Directors and child care employees do not have the time to sit at a computer and search for programs or grants. This kind of info has to drop into their laps. I know updating the SSPS attendance forms or secure access WA pages may be hard, but this is what is seen monthly and the absolutely best way to get information to centers. Really good comment. The FSK policies have made a huge difference. Our school for our school of being able to compensate employees more fairly and provide financial aid to families who need it. Significant process progress has been made on several fronts. I do worry about DCYF's capacity to keep so many initiatives and bodies of work moving simultaneously, working with childcare intermediaries such as Childcare Aware and Schools Out Washington would be a great way to manage the workload. And as an early learning coach working with providers, I am not seeing any of the benefits of these activities and they are all what providers want. That's fantastic feedback. And um, 
now perhaps would be an appropriate time to open up to the room. Um, maybe someone that did respond, it would like to expand or, or maybe that hearing some of these comments that are, that many of you share um, kind of opens up to a different thought process and there's something you'd like to share. So with that, I'd love to open up to the room. It's good. I do see a comment in chat from Lois. Um, this issue, wages, has been studied for years with no significant sustainable investment. To attract and retain staff, like any small business, we have to pass the labor and other rising costs onto our families. Thank you for the comment, Lois. Do any of these comments um, in the survey, do any of them kind of stand out to you as something that you would really like to be included in the recommendation report, either like a direct direct quote or or something that sparks something that you think could be uh, could inform some of the recommendations that you've either already developed or a new recommendation? Can I ask a clarifying question? When you say the report, we already have a report. What report is this one? We, we are talking about the uh, Fair Start for Kids Act Spending Goals and Strategies Recommendation Report. Um, the draft was sent out. Do we have a link for the draft, Jessica, that we can share in the chat? If not, we can drop the document. Um, but the draft was sent out to you guys, I believe, last week. Mm -hmm. So there's yes. the ELAC Reflection Report and then the Fair Start for Kids Act Spending Goals and Recommendations Spending Goals Strategy. The, the FSKA recommendation report um, that both will will be yearly reports that uh, ELAC works on. Okay. Yeah. And is there yeah. a connection between this report and the recommendations report? You mean this? So what, what we're looking at here is uh, this is a survey yes. that we asked you all before the recommendation report was actually a draft, I should say, was actually drafted. So this survey went out, you all provided all this great feedback at the same time, kind of on a parallel track. We then, um, Emily worked in some of the previous sessions on the jam boards where you all provided a ton of recommendations. And so Emily then took that and then drafted the uh, recommendation report itself. And so that recommendation report was, as Emily said, sent out last week. Mm -hmm. um, there are some there are survey monkey leaks embedded in it, which may be why it's kind of hard, it's a little bit confusing because we are asking for feedback on that report, that draft report in the same fashion. But in terms of what we're looking at here with this, this is a survey, kind of a pre-survey to to the report draft coming out and, and being shown to you guys. And again, it's just a draft. We have many, many iterations of this report to go through before. Um, you all say this is this is how we feel. This is this is what we want to now submit. Does that help okay. clarify a little, Susan? Well, I just there's just so I guess there's a lot of reports, but not a lot from what I can see, not a lot of uh, action being taken in the actual making things happen. So it's getting too. I feel like um, spend a lot of time writing reports and not enough time doing the work that's going to make the difference to keep centers from closing their doors. Yeah, I understand okay. that. Absolutely. Um, okay. And if I actually maybe could, I could help exp um, clarify what will this recommendation report be used for, right? So we're we're tasked with finishing this up by August 31st of this year. Um, the, the recommendation report will then be used by DCYF to look at next year's budget and decision packages. So this is an opportunity for you all to actually say, hey, here's what we think should be done. Um, the reason why maybe you haven't seen any of this done yet or feel like you haven't, because this report hasn't quite gone out and you haven't necessarily formally recommended this is what should be um, uh, being done. So hopefully, Susan, I think in, in as next year's budget and budgets forward and as all these, as the First Art for Kids Act kind of um, you know molds into something 
um, a little larger or whatnot, then I think that's when you'll start seeing. But some are of these this driven there. from the tracker, the Fair Start for Kids report? Uh, recommendations report tracker because I'm seeing in this report like expand language access recommendations. That might be the TLS know. tracker. That I'm might sorry? be that might be the TLS tracker you're referring yes, to. Yes, I'm talking about the TLS tracker. A different uh, a different report. It, you know, I that, know that, but I mean, okay. the, if the I guess what I'm getting at is the recommendations in this report are they driven from the recommendations from that report or just this survey? I can jump um, in if yeah uh, to help Please clarify. Do, Karen. Yeah, thanks, Karen. I, I think I I think I I understand what you're saying, Susan. Um, <clears throat> so just to clarify, when FSKA was passed, um, ELAC was specifically written into that bill, right? Um, because ELAC was tasked with the oversight and recommendations uh, for uh, certain moving parts of FSKA, right? So the oversight recommendations and monitoring was ELAC was assigned that work. Um, so that result that what we have on our plates right now, there's two things, right? Uh, there's the TLS, which you guys wrapped up at, at late last year. So that's temporary licensing subcommittee. FSKA created that. Um, they said ELAC needs to convene a subcommittee to produce recommendations around licensing specifically, right? So that's one track. And then on top of that, ELAC has this responsibility of producing an annual recommendations report around the spending goals and strategies of FSKA. So it, I think it's likely you're going to see uh, some overlap on the licensing pieces, right? Because I don't imagine there's a lot of daylight between what the TLS is going to recommend and what ELAC is going to recommend regarding licensing. So I do expect there to be some overlap there. Um, but the big difference is this one that we're looking at right now is an annual report and that uh, you guys will be doing ongoing feedback and recommendations on FSK spending goals and strategies. Uh, ELAC was the only group that was called out to do this um, for FSKA. So that's what that's that's what we're looking at today. But I can see how it could be confusing because the players and a lot of the feedback is going to be overlapping in the licensing piece. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. Yeah, that was way more eloquent. Um, so kind of back then now to the survey, right? Where um I, I we just had a chance to run through some further comments on on that first set of questions. And uh, now we're just kind of diving a little deeper into into some of the further comments from the survey, which again was done prior to the draft report that has now been sent to you all. And, and we will actually dive into that draft report at the back half of this meeting, as we had mentioned earlier. Um, so with that, if everyone's comfortable with that, I'll continue uh, with reading some of the follow-up comments. And then please do as, actually, I did see a hand raised. I, I, it might be gone now. Oh, I must've missed you. I'm sorry, I don't remember who that was. Okay. Well, we'll continue on. Okay, um, question 12. And now we're asking for a little more depth in some of the responses. Do you have a personal story or additional comments or suggestions regarding expanding provider supports and the related spending goals and strategies? First response, follow the science. Emlin, Pancoast, and Collins, Portland State University's 1970s. Thank you, we'll, like, we'll definitely make note of that and um, do a little more research on that. Uh, there seems to be an effort in some areas, but there has been little impact. Many senior centers continue to be short-staffed, and disparity in pay and compensation between ECE and K-12 teachers are still huge. I think that objectives need to be more equitable across the board with professional development incentives, scholarships, etc. We did not see any of, any of this with this use of money. I would like to learn more about what is happening. Many name the topic. I will share anecdotal stories from the field. Excellent. The healthcare was so exciting to then only be accessible for people 300% below poverty, yet trying to raise my staff wages means they're no longer eligible. We have to single-handedly fundraise to make any reliable funding happen. We are to we are to rural to have any subs from this program come to us. We see more and more gatekeeping that actively prevents new providers and teachers from joining the field. 
Rural Washington has been promised many things and not a single one has been helpful. We are still at pre-COVID levels and need a serious infusion of funds ASAP. It was amazing for me to be able to get to a silver level healthcare plan because previously I did not have healthcare provided and had a low cost catastrophic coverage plan. It helped me feel much less stressed and more comfortable in my daily life to know I could afford to get sick or injured. I hope this program continues past 2023. And I haven't seen any significant change with this funding. Does anyone have any additional comments to share? Or perhaps maybe something hearing some, some of um, your colleagues share the same sentiments has opened up um, something you'd like to share. I'll share, I'll go ahead and share. Um, uh, this is, it's really interesting. And I, um, for clarity, we're talking specifically here, this particular section of the survey is, corresponds with the report expand provider supports um, section. So this is only yes. one. Yes, this is all of all of the questions above were only on that. And so we are yeah. we're looking at um, informing this work is informing what we re recommend around expanding provider supports. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Okay. Yes. Okay. This this would be regarding, I think, like the the over the broad category of expanding provider supports, okay. which right. all of that falls into. Yes. Yeah, great. That's really helpful. Really helpful. Um, um I think uh, what I'm I'm noticing is that a lot of people who have answered this, and I would say uh, similar for me, is I don't really have, um, they either haven't seen changes uh, either at their, in their, um, in their setting, or they don't know, um, and whether there have been changes or not. And so I, I think I, um, how do we know uh, <laughs> uh, whether there have been changes in, say, compensation or um, healthcare? How are we getting that bigger picture of yeah. what is actually happening. Um, because if I were to, I mean, if I were answering the question, I would um, feel like I didn't have enough information to know if it's, if things are really better. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, I do know, and maybe Aaron, you could, if there is a little more context you could provide to this, but um, my understanding is that we are, there is an actual Fair Start for Kids Act report that DCYF is is drafting that is specific to all spending goals and strategies of the Fair Start for Kids Act and what was done, how it was done, what did it result in, you know, data, data, like all that stuff. I think that you're that you're talking about and looking for. Um, so I do anticipate that there is a uh, a report that will show at least the progress of many of those pieces, um, you know, whether it's something that will continue on in in, um, in new budgets, then I think a lot of that will be reflected in there because I think this is a very very organic piece of legislation, right? That's just going to kind of keep growing and adapting and moving. And I, mean, I do believe that that information will be given to you all um, as uh, for public consumption, and I believe that's being worked on kind of parallel to what it is that we're doing here. Does that make sense? So more to come, I guess. It makes sense. And it also, it is also hard because I think it would actually be what's really useful for us to be making recommendations about. Sure. Yeah, I get that. Uh, yeah, to know what the progress is so that we can make informed decisions. But yeah, thank you. yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dre, it looks like you have your hand raised. Yes. Hi. Um, so I just wanted to make a little comment about, um, I know we're talking about the lack of um, responses from the survey. And um, so I live in central Washington um, and uh, in Moses Lake specifically, and there is a couple daycare centers um, here. I've actually talked to some of the um, directors for them, um, some of the parents, and um, in the work that I do, I definitely feel like just all state agencies in general seem to have the same issue. There doesn't seem to be a connection with the community, um, and 
On top of that, um, there seems to obviously be a lack of trust. Um, I've seen time and time again where state agencies will pay a consultant millions of dollars instead of going straight to the experts. In this case would be the providers and parents. Um, they continue to survey and um, just basically it seems like a lot of folks feel like they're unheard or dismissed because there doesn't seem to be change on the ground. Thank you, Trey. Thank you for sharing. Deanna, it looks like you have your hand raised. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I have a couple of thoughts. Um, one, I'll, uh, I think the first thought is, I think that what we're seeing in the survey responses, this is just uh, an observation, is that I think that there's the intention of how the funds were expended for, for purpose and, uh, and versus an expectation of what the field expected to get. I think that there is a big divide between those two things. And so I, um, you know, I, I think there was a lot of investment in the subsidy system, for example, as a way to get more money to providers, but that isn't what providers were expecting to get with an investment. And I think at the core of a lot of these answers, as I am reading them, is this, this, this vast difference between what was invested in for purpose that may or may not have been understood by the community versus what they expected. So for example, they wanted healthcare, um, and so healthcare, the healthcare situation was created, um, but it didn't provide the relief that was needed um, broadly enough because it only went up to a certain level and didn't take in, into account the cost of living differentials across the state, for example. So I think that at the core of a lot of these issues is what the community expected to see versus what the investments were uh, for purpose didn't match up. And I think that is a huge piece of, of the challenge. And then the other thing that just comes up for me is, I, I, and I'd love to hear what other people think, but we could get more survey responses and we're talking a lot about survey responses, but I think this sort of reflects the community's feelings um, that, that they don't see the results. And so there's a part of me that wonders about um, you know, yes, we could put in a report and share this kind of response and people say, well, that wasn't enough of a response um, to make it valid or whatever. But at the end of the day, what I'm seeing here is a lot of what I'm hearing out in the field. Um, and so I wonder if it might not be better to do a few really focused to the point of somebody earlier in the call focused uh, uh, focus groups that really get at some of the communities that may not have engaged with um, a survey or won't ever engage with the survey um, and spend your time that way rather than us trying to get a bunch of people to respond um, and get just more maybe of similar perspective so those are two thoughts that are floating around in my brain i don't know if that's helpful That's really good, Dan. Uh, does anyone have anything to share related to some of Deanne's suggestions? I like the the smaller focus group. I think that makes sense and and being able to identify, uh, you know, where where are we missing it? Where, who are we not engaging with? Um, and then finding ways to bring them to the table and into the conversation. I think would be really really valuable. Olivia, it looks like you have your hand raised. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, I have been conducting a, a focus group slash survey of uh, licensed child care providers in Pierce County. And initially, we had intended to send out a email survey uh, similar in, in format to what you have here. Um, our feedback from the providers was that that would be something that they probably would would lose in their inbox and uh, would get lost along the way. So we ended up doing a telephone survey, uh, which is still in process, and we're getting amazing response from it. Uh, we had anticipated a lot of hangups and people not calling back or wanting to participate. Um, the conversations are lasting between 30 minutes and an hour for about a 10 question survey because there's so much feedback. It's not it's not this topic, it's a different topic, but uh, there's so much feedback that the childcare providers are interested in sharing on the topic 
uh, um, that I'm conducting research on. But uh, the other thing that we found was that it was easier for them to pick up the phone, answer a phone call and have a conversation where they're answering the questions versus responding in this format. Um, and then it allows uh, where there's a question, uh, acronyms are often misunderstood. And then uh, the other issue is the language that's used for advocates in the field is not necessarily the same language that the provider community is using. And so there's a disconnect between, you know, what they're how, what they're what they're aware of, I guess, and um, how the language that's used is not maybe the language that the providers would use um, in defining things, and it just makes it a little bit easier to answer questions during a phone call. Um, so I just wanted to add that perspective um, and make sure that you know how as we're communicating out um, that we're we're using the the proper terms and defining things so that it's easily understood. That's, that's interesting, Olivia. Are, are you doing the um, phone surveys yourself or do you have your, your team? Right now I'm doing them myself. We're hoping to bring on a, an intern fellow to help conduct. But what we've kind of found is that the level of engagement is so yeah. high, which is unexpected. And so it'd be really hard to train someone to answer the questions that the providers are asking. Um, but yeah, right now. It's yeah. Just okay. Yeah, that's great. Does anyone have any any further thoughts on that, on some of the work that Olivia has been doing and, and you know, capturing voices, but it may be in a different manner? I would just say my assumption would be, Olivia, that it has worked out that way because you created those relationships and that trust within uh, those providers. So I think that that would be a hurdle for uh, DCYF. I see. Yeah. So if we were just to start calling I mean, say myself starts calling then uh, obviously that relationship hasn't been built over time and the chances of a provider really really opening up to me might be um, a little less yeah that's a really good point Trey. i appreciate that that feedback susan looks like you have your hand raised yeah i was gonna say i think i think deanne uh described things pretty well but i think the part that's missing is that like for instance with the healthcare stuff the feedback was offered that what about the areas where we've had to increase compensation? Be, I mean, it will leave out a lot of people. And so when the feedback is given ahead of time and then there's no solution for it and you charge ahead with whatever that plan was that didn't work for a good number of people, that's the part that get, is missed that, you know, that, that yes, there's, a, there's an expectation. And then there's also the fact that when um, the expectation isn't met, but the feedback that was given to perhaps mitigate the expectation not being met, that's where frustration builds even further. So, I mean, it's kind of like, um, you know, put, you know, putting, it's like putting out the carrot and then pulling it back, even though we have the feedback to make sure the carrot fits for everybody. So that, that I think that they, Deanne is correct, but also, it isn't that people didn't try to prevent this uh, unmet expectation from happening. All right, yeah. thank you, Susan. Colleen, looks like you have something to share or a question maybe. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Um, I'm really thinking about, obviously I do work with um, Washington Communities for Children and, um, you know, hosting groups as a, you know, trusted messenger with a lot of things. and. Um, have met with DCYF staff about, you know, communications and how when they come from those who are, you know, more trusted representatives and stuff that there's more of a response and those kinds of things. But I'm also learning, you know, how to make sure that then as a trusted messenger, when I'm sending out those communications, how am I being responsible with the information that is gathered, you know, essentially through me. And so, um, my question or, or, or wondering here is, you know, can DCYF and or this group or, or whoever create some information, um, whether it's a one page or something like that, about how the information collected from the survey is going to be used? Because I think we even brought up our own questions about, 
why are we looking at this data? Why did we ask for it? What are we going to do with it? And if those of us here on this meeting aren't really sure what we're going to do with it, how do we then communicate that to the people that we are asking to spend their time? You know, if they do hop on a phone call for 30 minutes, that would be hugely valuable information. But then I think we need to be very transparent about how we intend to use their information going forward. And I suspect that there's a lot of people who didn't reply to this survey either because they're kind of burnt out on surveys and don't ever see where their information goes or they have questions about how anonymous it will or will not be um, and those kinds of things. So I think having some of that information spelled out ahead of time that then we can, you know, pass along to those trusted messengers and then make sure that then they are able to maintain their integrity and their responsibility to the folks that they're gathering on DCYF's behalf to get this information. Um, I think we could go a long way by just having those steps planned out ahead of time. And also just reflecting on seeing things in the chat that there were people who were named as um, having communicated things and they don't remember seeing the email. So I think too, just if DCYF communication or uh, community engagement team can reach out individually. Like if I got a phone call from you, Eric, that said, we sent this along, we know that you have, you know, these email lists and groups that you convene, it would be really important to us if you were able to share that, then that way I can get my couple questions answered and do that. And it's more on my radar mm -hmm. because I will admit community engagement has its own folder in my inbox. <laughs> And most of the time I'm reading it just ahead of ELAC meetings and different things like that. So I myself missed this survey and I didn't think to share it with anybody. Um, so just, I guess, some advice and wondering about some things we can do differently. Yeah, that's that's actually really good, um, Colleen. That makes a lot. Of, and we appreciate you giving us our own special folder. Um, I hope all of you have a special folder for community engagement as well. Um, yeah, I, I think that... Um, being able to find a better way to obviously the trust i mean it comes up we we hear it a lot um and and i think you know we send out the survey and maybe some of you all are seeing it and you're engaging and maybe you you are or aren't for certain reasons but really taking the opportunity i think to you know on a personal touch call it of being able to say hey uh, you know we did send this out um, we know you typically love, you know, to be a participant in this, just wanted to make sure you had a chance. And, and I think that over time, we could definitely find better mechanisms on for community engagement of being able to, to do a lot of those pieces. Um, and I know that, as I mentioned, some of the work that we're going to be doing down the road with community engagement and really looking at our uh, processes and the way that we co-design with the community, um, I think some of that work will help iron out some of these pieces, like clarifying how we will be using your data. That is something that is um, definitely uh, important in doing co-design work. And so, um, you know, hearing that from you, Colleen, is comforting because that's something that we know we we need to work on, and we are, um, and, and we do anticipate to kind of round some of that out over time. So are, are there any other comments related to some of the questions that we've addressed so far again into the survey right now we're just kind of looking at the data from the survey on how you all feel about how dcyf is doing um, with implementing the third start for kids act not necessarily the recommendation report itself which we'll dive into and how are you all feeling with me reading all of these questions to you we, we you know we still do have a few more to get through this this is a fairly lengthy meeting up until noon. Um, we will dive into the recommendation report at say 11 or or 11.30ish. Um, but I'm wondering if you're all comfortable with going through these kind of as we were before and then getting to those discussion questions and then me reading them and then just letting you all participate. Is everyone good with that? And I'll take silence as meaning that you are good with that. Can I actually jump in real quick, Eric? Yes, uh, can you can. Stop screen sharing just for a sec. I want to be able to see people's faces. I'm hearing so many great ideas. And I also don't want to overpromise or like, um, you know, hear things and say, yeah, that's great. And then, you know, not get back to you guys on it. We do have the last meeting that ELAC has to work on this report before it needs to be turned in is August 1st. Um, so 
with the survey, we that's why we kind of had the end of end of July as the deadline, so we could try and incorporate survey responses into the draft report and have it ready for you guys on August first, which again is the last meeting um, that we have before this needs to be turned in. And um, I also want to own. We started this. Our team started this. DCYF started this way too late in the process, and we are hearing that you guys have so much you want to do, and it's going to be great. Um, and next year we will jump on it as soon as possible. So we're not starting this late for you guys. Um, but I just wanna put that out there that our deadline is, is coming pretty quickly. Um, so with that in mind, I, I definitely think we are not going to have the capacity to, um, apart from those who answered the survey and want, uh, want further, are willing to share their stories further, we're not going to have the, um, opportunity to do a ton more outreach with this survey. Um, so I just want to get that out there and hear any thoughts um, or if that, you know, changes anything for you guys. If I could add something to that, Emily. Um, uh, uh, Emily brings up a really good point. I think it's really important to kind of remind ourselves of uh, like the scope that we're dealing with in this moment. But as she mentioned, um, we'll be able to start this process a lot earlier in the process next time. So these ideas are still really good. And it's things that I think we should definitely be talking through and making note of for the next round for how to make this survey process more robust. So not that there's no place, not not that um, there there's no value in talking this through, but I think that it's good to kind of keep in mind the deadline that we're working with. Sorry, Lois, I didn't see your hand there. Go ahead. No, you're fine. And I can say, Emily, I appreciate the uh, transparency about capacity. I know I had mentioned that in the chat um, about how important that, about how much time there is knowing the deadline for this report. Um, so just wanted to, to say, I do appreciate that. And I think the question is, um, what can we do since it doesn't close until July 26 to get it out? And you had asked for clarification on what newsletter and it's the, the general DCYF, um, communication from the communication department that they send out on occasion where Ross might write something or definitely ELAC and provider supports meetings are listed um, and other, you know, DCYF inter, um, information. So I don't know when that next one is coming out, but was thinking if, you know, if it's this week or even if it's early next week, um, that would still give us time to have um, some more input from across the field because it will go to more people who might actually open it up as well as having links for the various groups and coalitions to send out to their members um, with hopefully that one pager or something that just kind of um, says why this is important and why folks feedback is needed. Thank you, Lois. I, I do believe that Ross's monthly newsletter is what you may be referring to. And I think it's the second Tuesday of every month, which means it's probably going to be out. If it hasn't been sent out today, then it maybe would later on this afternoon. Um, I'll clarify though, that that's something definitely we can look at. And I, I know there's other newsletters that go out, obviously, um, from communications departments. So maybe there's an opportunity to also include that survey into pushing some of those out, whether it's the Fair Start for Kids Act newsletter that is also um, every two months, I believe. Yes, and and that is, no, not that one. And you're right, it is the DCYF Digest. I just looked it up. You did, okay. Um, but I think as we move forward, as Deanne, Deanne put in the chat, is making sure that our recommendations are very clear and something that legislate can legislators, excuse me, can act on. Um, so I just wanted to share that out loud. Thank you, Deanne. Yeah, thank you, Deanne. Well, being mindful of our time, um, it, it, I mean, obviously the recommendations is going to be the biggest piece. It sounds like that that's what you're most interested in. We 
we could maybe take a short break and dive right into the actual recommendation report draft that you all have seen. Um, there, there is some great feedback in there. And, and I think maybe for those of you that haven't seen it yet, of course, we're gonna be sending out the link. You'll have a, a little more time to be able to provide additional edits into that. But I'm wondering if maybe pivoting over into that report itself, it's about six pages. And I would hate for us to not get to that today and, and or have to rush some of that at the end. Um, whereas, you know, this survey results here, this is something that we can absolutely curate and send. I think we sent out possibly to all of you um, already. So um, with everyone's agreeance, I don't know, Emily, how do, how do you feel about that? Yeah, and I misspoke. So August 1st is the ELAC report development session. You guys also voted to have another report development session August 15th. So I think we can definitely close the survey end of July now. I don't know. I don't know how I missed that August 15th meeting, but you do have two more meetings to go over this. So we can extend the survey to the end of July. I, I still am hesitant to agree to, to doing any additional like cold calls or anything like that. But um, thank you, Enrica, for pointing that out. And sorry that we misspoke on that. Two more meetings. Okay, good. So a little more time. Well, um, how about, I mean, unless again, unless somebody really wants to keep diving through this survey, which I think at some point will be, since this will be open a little longer, then obviously we, I think the full results we can provide you at a later date. Um, so why don't we hop into the draft recommendation report and I will put that up on my screen. Um, and hopefully all of you have had a chance to see that prior to this meeting. And Jess, could you maybe drop that into the chat or Emily, drop that draft report in if anybody wants to open that up as we're going along? Or do you guys also want to take a, a quick break? I mean, we've been at it here for a little over an hour. Is everyone comfortable powering through or do you all want a five minute breather? Five minutes would be great. All right, deal. How about we will give everyone a short five minute break. It is 1018. We will see you back at 1023. Make sure and stretch. We'll see you shortly. Hi y'all, welcome back. Give everybody a quick second to settle in. I hope you did do something. Stood up. I did not stand up. But I'm looking forward to standing up at noon. Okay. Well, um, we're going to now kind of pivot into a second part of, of the meeting. Uh, this is now going to focus on the recommendation report itself. Uh, and, you know, before we, we dive in, um, obviously, you all have had a great, have had an opportunity to, to really reflect on where we've hit the mark and maybe where we have an opportunity to um, to do a little more. And we rec we completely recognize that the First Start for Kids Act was a large, massive piece of legislation that um, set out to do a, a number of great things. And over the last year and a half to two years, you know, many of those have been accomplished. Uh, and, and at the same time, many of those are still in progress and still in work. And, and if, it, if there's one thing that we can take from this first half of the conversation is we at DCYF, we completely hear you. We do. We hear you. I know it may feel like we don't at times, um, but we really do. And um, having you all participate in these types of exercises and these feedback sessions really allow us to um, better reflect on how uh, the FSKA will adapt and mold and continue to do great things. So uh, the great part about that is the recommendation report that we are now going to start looking into has that opportunity to actually now start putting some meaningful recommendations in front of DCYF and um, allowing uh, them or us to be able to, to use that as, as the legislation kind of adapts and moves forward. So before we dive into 
the recommendation report. Does anyone have any overarching questions or anything they'd like to share? Okay, sometimes when it's so quiet, I wonder if my headphones are working and I'm the only one that doesn't know it. Um, okay, let's dive into now the recommendation report itself. So we did share this about a week ago, is that right? Oh, there we go. Excellent. Um, here is the front cover. This may look familiar here. Uh, we sent this out, I think a little over a week ago and some of you may have missed it. And that's okay. Uh, we've we've of course dropped the report back in to chat, and we'll make sure that afterward that we're able to. Um, well, we're going to have additional drafts of this, right? So there will be further opportunities for everyone to engage further with this. As Emily mentioned, whether it's the eighth or the August first version or the version we share August fifteenth, um, I do anticipate this report will go through um, a few iterations which is great because this is all really reflected from your voice so the report itself is categorized into those eight larger buckets which we've all kind of went through during that survey um, expand provider supports expand language access implement grants strengthen prenatal to three supports expand ecap early therapeutic and prevention services subsidy and making child care more affordable expanding child care licensing resources and implement data and accountability. Um, you all are very aware of the purpose of this report, as Emily described in the beginning. This is something that will be an annual report now every year. We are going to um, work through this report together and we'll start much earlier next year. Um, and I think that we've obviously learned um, a lot of, of how we can create a little better report moving forward. Um, but for now, we have a really good start here. We really do, right? You know, we have some really good quality recommendations. I think that if we can get you all to go a little deeper with it, that that'll provide a little more robust nature to the recommendations themselves. Um, and then with that, this is your opportunity, I think, for us as a group to uh, really talk about it amongst each other and and really feel like you're in a safe inclusive space to to be able to say hey i agree with that or i don't agree with that or or maybe you are missing this um so now jumping into first category and this is expanding provider supports one of the first recommendations is shift income from federal poverty level to area meeting in median income and I took that from one of our jam boards. So I was hoping that, yeah, I was gonna say, if you can see my comment in there, I wasn't exactly sure which what that applied to. It was on a jam board sticky note. Um so if that strikes something and someone's, oh, that was my comment and this is what I meant. Um we're just trying to figure out where. Yeah. Is maybe the individual that provided that comment maybe here and can answer. If, if does this relate to subsidy? We do believe it does, but we don't want to answer for you. It's okay. We'll, Emily and I can go a little deeper on, um, on this particular recommendation. And then as maybe we get through that second draft, uh, we'll have a little more context on how that specifically applies. But as I mentioned, our assumption is this does apply to subsidy itself. Um, okay, next recommendation. Providers are facing increasing challenges in providing quality early learning services to their community. Low wages, unfunded mandates, educational requirements, and barriers to language access have contributed to these challenges. To achieve the hope set out with FSKA, DCYF, and the legislature should work with providers, parents, and communities to ensure that the workforce receives a thriving wage, professional development opportunities are accessible and affordable, and there are proper resources and supports for infants, toddlers, and children with special needs. This is a path to a stable, affordable, high-quality early learning system in Washington State. Now, as I read that, um, it's fantastic, right? It, it really does say, hey, this is something that, that we should be doing, DCY should be doing. Um, what I think it might be missing is specifically what it is that we could be doing differently for some of these areas. So um, with that, I'm wondering if the group or anyone in the room 
has some thoughts as to maybe how this recommendation, we can provide a, a little bit more context to it. And I will open that up to the room. Eric, can I ask a clarifying question? Yes, you can. Um, are you looking for language that would be the nuts and bolts of how to accomplish this? Or are we just looking to further define the goal and add some more specifics there? That is a great question. Um, my, my assumption is that these are recommendations, right, that you all are making to DCYF. So the more specific that you can be with those recommendations and the more clear maybe you can be with those recommendations um, and, and not as generalized, maybe like, for example, that just, you know, ensuring that the workforce receives a thriving wage and professional development opportunities are accessible and affordable. Like how, you know, how, how do you all recommend that we do that? Assuming that you don't believe we're already doing that. Does that help a little, Colleen? Helps very much. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, you bet. Um, Danny here. Um, I I think I'm wondering a few things specifically about that subsequent line of and the proper resources and support for infants, toddlers, and children with special needs. Um, I'm kind of hesitating on the language special needs, which is a euphemism. Um, are we specifically talking about children with suspected and identified disabilities? Um, and I do think that there's a lot of internal work that DCYF has to do in terms of how they are uh, ensuring that children who've been determined eligible for IDEA are able to access ECAP programming with or without an IEP. Right now, as it stands, it's only with an IEP, uh, which means that children who have been determined, for example, um, eligible for an IEP through a school district are not able to enroll in an ECAP program while their IEP is being written, which can take you know, up to 35 school days. So if they got determined eligible at the end of a school year, the school year is then not, um, or the school district is then not writing an IEP during the summer months. So during the summer months, that child is not eligible for ECAP services. Um, they cannot enroll in an ECAP program if that's what is what made them eligible. So I think, um, <laughs> There's, there's a lot to unpack specifically in this line, uh, in my opinion. Are we specifically referring to disabilities when we're talking about special needs? And how is DCYF creating clarity even within their own systems for ensuring that those children are in fact eligible and enrolled in these programs? And then beyond that, our state um, overwhelmingly uses developmental preschool as a placement option for children with disabilities. But DCYF is not doing anything to bridge that gap for children with school district placements to ensure that they're able to access both their developmental preschool program and their ECAP services. Families tend to choose uh, child care options that are close to where they work, um, but school districts are who they have to access special education um, services through. And that is, they don't always live, obviously, where they work, at least in King and Pierce County. So um, I think there's a lot of room for connecting with OSPI in creating some clarity and some consistency between those two systems to ensure that children with disabilities are able to access both an ECAP program, for example, and their special education services through a school district. Um, but I mean, there's more to that. So yeah, yeah. No, that's that's really that's great, Danny. That's that's kind of what I think would would give this report some teeth uh, is, you, you know, those specifics as to how can DCYF, you know, actually do this. Um, and Danny, I like how you talked about bridging the, the gap that we need to bridge that gap. Do you do you have a, um, I guess, a better uh, understanding or an idea of what we can do to bridge that gap? Is it just about starting working with OSPI closer or are there other things that we could be doing? Yeah, um, I think 
there's a lot, and I, I imagine there's probably people on this call that might have things to add to this conversation as well. So I want to make sure we don't take up too much space. But I think two examples that kind of come to mind is um, I think the existing gap for enrollment in ECAP programs and the misunderstanding of, you know, families don't always choose to access an IEP, um, even if their child is eligible, but that eligibility still for IDEA services should still make them eligible for ECAP programming because that child is no less disabled. They still have the disability. Their family just may not have chosen to access IEP services for one reason or another. Um, not having access to transportation, for example, to get their child to a developmental preschool program means that they might have had to choose between developmental preschool and ECAP programming. So I think Conversations within DCYF to better understand IDEA in general and what makes children eligible for um, services through, you know, that mechanism of protections. I, it's not clear that that is a, an understanding from them. So maybe that is, you know, getting some consulting from various um, entities. I know there are many agencies out there that can provide that. Um, ESD is one of them. And um, so getting a better understanding of what IDEA eligibility means and how there can be more clarity in ensuring that children are visible through the enrollment and recruitment processes for ECAP. Um, but I also think, yes, there does need to be really clear communication between DCYF, ECAP, and OSPI because they are supporting the same pool of children, but there is no clear um, existence of communication between those two entities. So I think DCYF or and ECAP specifically think that inclusion means simply having children with disabilities present in our programs. And having children present in our programs is not the same as inclusion. <laughs> inclusion is providing those supports for those children. But there are not any existing supports identified for those children. It's just simply having them present. Um, so I think having some communication between, a lot of communication between OSPI so that DCYF has a clear understanding of what lead education authorities are legally responsible for and how ECAP can be supporting children in a child care setting outside of whatever those hours are to ensure that families are getting the services that they need, not just what school districts are offering. Um, and so that school districts know that DCYF is a supportive partner in ensuring that children and families have the access to the services that they need and want for their child, not just what school districts are limited in being able to offer preschool age children. I hope that Enrique? makes sense. Yeah, no, that's, that's fantastic, thank you. Uh, Enrique, it looks like you have something to share. Yes, thank you. Um, first, I uh, just wanna uh, thank, thank you, Danny, for all that you shared and especially for um, calling out the um, concern about using the terminology special needs. Um, very much appreciate that. Um, just wanted to um, add a little thought that sort of, um, Danny was kind of speaking a lot about that connection with ECAP and I just wanted to throw in um, uh, something that sort of seen um, for um, children not necessarily tied to ECAP, but I think it fits here um, when we're thinking about trying to expand um, supports for um, providers and for families. Um, what we're seeing a lot is for, you know, I know of some families who are really struggling to access um, um, access childcare or have their children remain in childcare programming uh, because they are being um, asked to provide a one-on-one -on -one full-time aid for their child in order to stay in the childcare. Um, and so that, you know, really that, when I reflect on that example of what I'm hearing from families, that really, um, you, you know, highlights not only um, challenges with access, but it also highlights, you know, I know pr providers are doing their very best to support all the children in their care. And that's really highlighting their providers don't have the supports that they need um, either. And so I just wanted to throw that um, out there as something that, um, you know, I have been seeing um, in my work, hearing in my work, I suspect uh, probably others in uh, various communities have as well. And just wanted to put that out there because that's not necessarily tied to, to ECAP, but it is something for consideration when we're thinking about ensuring that there are the supports 
in place um, to ensure that all families um, have access to care and that all providers have the supports that they need in order to meet the, to, to support the children that are coming to them or are in their care. Thank you, Enrica. Thank you for sharing. Don't see any other hands raised, uh, which maybe would be a good time to hop into the next recommendation. Uh, this relates to creating more outreach strategies. And the recommendation reads to learn more about the way providers, parents, and the community are impacted by FSK initiatives. The department should create more outreach strategies that allow community gatherings. Engaging with advisory groups like ELAC should be one tool DCYF uses along with on the ground outreach to connect with providers who know what resources would keep them providing quality childcare in their communities. And I think this recommendation is a really good example of how the FSKA recommendation report and the TLS temporary licensing subcommittee uh, recommendation report will kind of work in tandem and, and potentially have many of the same topics. Um, this particular recommendation was also captured in the TLS recommendation report um, for those of you maybe that might recognize that. And so now understanding the two and their similarity, um, I would love maybe to open this up to the room and, and hear some further thoughts on what, what are some more outreach strategies that DCYF could, could look at doing. Uh, it, it's Danny again. Um, I, I would suggest that um, DCYF connect specifically with the Special Education Action Council, which is referred to as SEAC, um, especially since children with disabilities are a prioritized population, again, in ECAP, and that is not all childcare, but um, based on the numbers that ESA is seeing and knowing that you know their numbers have tripled in identifying children with disabilities over the last couple of years, I think that our systems need to be better prepared in understanding the influx of children who have suspected and identified disabilities in all of our programs. So connecting more with special education entities such as SEAC um, would be a really great way for them to get some visibility and clarity and bring attention to specifically preschool age children in those systems. Very good. Does anyone have any other groups or organizations that you think we should connect with? that we're not already developing a relationship with? Well, if you do this, again, this graph will be sent out uh, again, and, and you all are gonna have a few more opportunities, right, to be able to provide further details into this. So, um, you know, hopefully this is, is kind of stimulating some thought that, that down the road as we progress through this, um, maybe many of you have an opportunity to, to provide a little further feedback into this. And if not, then, uh, you know, what's great is those that you are, that are participating, it sounds like many of you are agreeing with. Um... Okay, well, how about we will hop into the next recommendation. Um, DCYF should work with the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges to ensure that those utilizing provider access and community equivalent PACE who want to end up with a Bachelor of Arts in early childhood education have the opportunity to do so. In addition to sharing information and providing access to PACE and other educational pathways, the experience waiver should be broadly promoted so that providers are aware of all of their options. And we do have a couple clarifying questions on here. Um, first, we want to make sure that this, is this the correct board? I think that note was just for me. Unless oh, I, just... it is the wrong board. Sorry, I should have removed that. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, then we assume that it is. Um, okay. Yes. And then I think maybe this particular question, Emily, was something we wanted to make sure that, that this was the same. So when referring to the experience waiver, 
um, is that the same as the experience-based competency? And I think that's something that we will make sure to clarify. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone here maybe that provided that recommendation has any, any further background to that. I think the recommendation was experience-based competency. And I just want to make sure that the experience waiver is the correct Got it. Okay. Correct that they're referring to. Yeah, we can obviously that's something we can we can bird dog after this. I don't think we necessarily have to have that answer right here. Um and uh, last few recommendations in expanding provider supports. Uh, we have provide resources for education and healthcare to bring people into the field. DCYF should continue to offer scholarships and FSK a funded premium assistance through the Washington Health Benefit Exchange. When new requirements and mandates are implemented, DCYF needs to prevent the cost from being passed to families and should provide funding in addition to working alongside providers to achieve compliance to support providers and encourage retention of thriving wage and support from burnout is necessary. We are seeing across many workforces that caregivers are experiencing burnout because of challenging behaviors and a lack of good support for those in the workforce. So it looks like our recommendation from this particular paragraph is when new requirements and mandates are implemented, DCYF needs to prevent the cost from being passed to families and should provide funding in addition to working alongside providers to achieve compliance. Um, I would love to hear some of your thoughts and oh, wonderful, Deanne, please share. I guess my question is what does, I read that and I don't know what that means. I'm wondering if we need to be a bit more pointed in what we're trying to say, which I think is, um, you know what I hear from the feedback and I hear from the field and I see in the comments is sort of um you know we recommend that um eligibility is considered based on uh, a more broad-based look at who is able to access based on cost of living across our our state um because this looks like what I'm I mean this feels a bit more like uh, we we're gonna there's costs that are gonna get passed on to families and we're gonna provide direct funding when I think what the real issue is is that we need to um, create uh, expand eligibility to um, to to more, more more providers I I don't know it just feels a little veiled for me to yeah. understand what the recommendation is yes yeah, Susan. Yeah, so recently I heard a news article that PLU is offering tuition free teaching degrees. And you have to make a commitment to, you know, teach because we're, you know, teachers are leaving the field. And I think from a recommendation standpoint, and, and then the University of Washington also received something like $38 million from the Balmer Foundation to provide tuition free ECE degrees. But the caveat there is that you have to first get your first two years in and then you have to declare you want to do ECE, but then now you've incurred all this debt, and why would you go into the ECE field if you can't make the money to pay back your debt, and so on and so forth. So I think what we have to do is we have to really be hardcore here and say, we if we want to attract people to this field, we need to first remove cost as a barrier completely if they are if we're going to, to want to have a more educated workforce which we can't really have that expectation unless we can increase compensation. So we have this chicken and egg thing going on, but from a recommendation standpoint, I mean, what we suggested, we asked for a premium free uh, insurance through the child, the health benefit exchange for if you are employed in a child care center, um, be, no, no matter what your income level was, that was de declined. And that's why so many providers were unable to access, at least in, in the Seattle area. I think we have to get very specific and it's gonna be, if this is about how much money we need to ask for, then, and what level of access can we have with the capital gains tax windfalls that we're seeing that right now, none have been guaranteed toward specifically licensed childcare, but you know, just the education system and early learning in general, but really put 
you know, so, you know, recommendations like that, that if you want to pursue or ECE, you can go to these places and get tuition free BAs from da da da, you know, and here's why, because we need teachers in the workforce, just like we need teachers in the public education system. So I, I think that's how specific we need to be with a recommendation. Uh, because it's about asking for money, I presume, since this is the recommendation from the, you know, from the Fair Start for Kids Act, because we want to remove mm -hmm. barriers to people entering the field. Well, the barriers are all related to money, because nobody in the field makes enough to, to get an education or to even take care of their own families. And now we're seeing more and more people leave the field as a consequence. They're not coming in, they're leaving. So we have to come up with some real tangible, impactful solutions. Otherwise, we are going to have way bigger problems than we have now. Thank you, Susan. Olivia. I just, um, th this isn't a specific, but I just want to say that um, in reading the recommendations here and in other reports, it feels like um, to me, uh, as an outsider in this group, and I appreciate being part of this space, but um, it feels like to me in workforce development for um, child care that we talk about how you can fulfill the requirements that the state has to be a workforce in this workforce versus incentivizing the workforce to enter the workforce or to, the potential worker to enter this workforce. Um, and from a recruitment perspective, um, it's sort of an odd way to approach it. If you look at the STEM field or other career fields that um, we are attempting to recruit in our state, we, we approach that recruitment from an incentivizing approach and childcare workers, um, this work seems to be here, we'll make it a little easier for you to reduce the burden of our requirements for you to be in the field versus we are going to incentivize you to enter this career field. Um, and, I, and I think that that's a, an approach that if we could advocate more for incentivizing versus reducing the, the requirement burden or making it easier to fulfill the requirements, um, that potentially would help. Um, in the military space, uh, childcare workers have a mandated uh, on base on the military bases, the child care workers either receive 100% or 50% tuition for their children in at the child care centers. Uh, that's mandated by the Department of Defense. And, you know, something, um, you know, and I'm not suggesting that the provider pay that, but if there's some way that we could see incentives like that, that are um, the, the provider business not pay that, but if we could have incentives like that, across the board that were mandated and paid for by the state, I think it would make recruitment easier. We see that in other sectors that are recruiting childcare workers into the workforce like the military and, and the success that they're having from that. Just wanted to add incentivizing versus making it easier to fulfill requirements. Does anyone have any further thoughts on Olivia's Point. I thought it was really good. It, it makes sense. Well, thank you, Olivia, for sharing. Um, I lastly, think, I think yeah, Deanne, go ahead. Deanne's comment um, making all child care providers eligible despite income may be too big an ask and take all the money the state has to spend. Perhaps make an inter intermediary recommendation that include a new eligibility measure that would utilize self-sufficiency self index by area of the state so that there is equity of access. Utilizing any measure that is based on a statewide measure will be inequitable. So I just want to bring that up to the group about which, how we want to make, how you guys want to make that recommendation. And I see some hands. Colleen? Yeah, I just wanted to remind everybody and or for those who are not aware, um, Senate Bill 5225, um increased access to working connections for child care provider staff. As of October 1st, 2023, child care staff will be able to earn up to 85% of SMI and receive working connections child care so long as they meet all the other requirements of working connections regularly. 
However, that is an increase in income compared to other families. Other families will still need to earn 60% of SMI or less to qualify for working connections. So there is already an income incentive or change there, specifically calling out child care providers, which is going to be hugely helpful to providers and recruiting staff and are supporting their current staff. Because if you are giving a discount to your employee for their child care because they can't otherwise afford it, but you need them as a staff member, um, that's a burden to the business, causes a lot of other issues. And technically, anything more than a 20% discount that you give to your staff member, they now have to claim as income, which then can disqualify them from other programs like housing, food stamps, TAN etc. So it causes a lot of different issues when a provider is burdened with having to subsidize their staff's um, uh, tuition for, for their children. Um, so yes, there is already work being done in this space. I think it's hugely helpful. Um, you know, 85% of SMI is, is a big step. And I believe that number was determined because that is the cap that we can use our block grant dollars in the subsidy system. Um, and so that's, that's huge. That is a goal of Fair Starts for Kids in the long run for all families to be able to access. But as of October 1st, childcare staff will be able to do that. Thanks, Colleen. Lois? Uh, thank you, Emily. Uh, one of the things I just was thinking about when it comes to, Deanne had mentioned the self-sufficiency um, scale. And Deanne, I was wondering if you could um, come off your mute and elaborate as to why you think that would be a good um Sorry, why you think that would be a good way to figure out who can receive the health care benefits and um, if you can put a link in the chat so others who may not be yeah. familiar with it can um, take a look at it. Yeah, definitely. Um, thanks, Lois. Um, the, the reason why I like the self-sufficiency index is because it basically indexes across all communities in Washington state, the cost for basic living expenses, including childcare. Many other indexes don't include childcare as a way of figuring out the cost of living in an area. Self-sufficiency indexes, the, the one that I, my favorite one, of course, is um, the one in our backyard, which is created by the University of Washington, but MIT has also created one as well. And those, um, so it basically says the cost of housing, transportation, childcare, food, um, medical, dental, uh, et cetera, et cetera. This is the cost for, and it's uh, calibrated based on size of family. What I appreciate about that is that the cost of housing, I'll just use in my area in Seattle, to rent an apartment, a, a two bedroom apartment is well over $2,000. In another area of the state, you may be able to rent a two bedroom apartment for $1,000. And it, what it gets at is everybody needs to have a home. They need to have access to childcare if they have children and are working. They need to have insurance. They need to eat food. And food costs are differentiated as well based on where we live. And so for me, it's saying we want to give everybody a basic package of living, uh, what, no matter where they live. That feels equitable versus saying that we are going to provide um, a, blan a blanket level, which always has winners and losers when it's across a law of averages. It's just a mathematical problem. And so that's what I appreciate about a more differentiated approach to making eligibility, which would help get at some of the things, Susan, you're bringing up, where the cost of employment um, might be higher in Seattle than it is in another community based on um, the um, the minimum wage laws that are specific to that area versus another area of the state. So I think I, that's why I love the self-sufficiency index. And I'll share that. I can grab the link here and put it in the chat. Thank you for that. Yeah, I'm looking forward to see that. Any further thoughts on some of our discussion here related to 
uh, the healthcare exchange or health benefit exchange, excuse me. Oh, thank you, Susan, we appreciate that. Well, how about we'll move into the last recommendation, which actually is very appropriate for the conversations you've been having. Um, you're saying make it easy to tease out what is being done to address wage inequality within the early learning sector. Charging more for care does not always lead to a thriving wage for providers. Providing high quality early learning is more than just a per child amount. Wondering if that leads to any further discussion or if uh, anyone has any suggestions on maybe making that a little bit more of a specific recommendation. Well, if you do, on the report, you will see at the end of each section, we actually have the survey uh, embedded in here. So when you're when you're reviewing the draft after this meeting, um, or even further drafts, that when you get done with a section, you can just click the survey, and then from there, you'll have an opportunity to say, um, I like this, I don't like that, change this, change that. Um, so hopefully that makes it a little easier for you all to navigate through the drafts that come through. So with that, I will move to the expand language access recommendation. Ah, there's that link we were waiting on. Thank you. Um, recommendations. Providing caregivers and families, families whose first language is not English should have access to information, resources, excuse me, providers, caregivers, and families whose first language is not English should have access to information, resources, and services in their preferred language. Existing translation and interpretation services without the proper context and cultural relevancy are not enough to ensure equitable access. DCYF should work with providers to identify spaces that already exist. Anyone have anything to share or possibly uh, the individual that made that recommendation? If you were here, we'd love to um, hear a little bit of expansive thought, maybe a little more specific as what we can do. This recommendation came from a couple of different places and recommendations, um, but I but uh, what I'm curious about is the DCYF should work with providers to identify spaces that already exist. If that brings anything up for anybody to elaborate on um, the kind of spaces, I think it's called out later that yeah okay in the second paragraph that um, that maybe a recommendation you guys want to make is to pay providers to translate and interpret for their own community. But looking at that, identifying spaces that already exist, um, if there's any more context anybody has about that. How about we'll hop into that next recommendation, which Emily kind of touched base on a little bit. Um, sharing knowledge is about building relationships. Create opportunities for providers to build relationships via expanded language access and provide resources or hire, hire bilingual staff for customer service, frontline staff, licensors, and coaches. Include cultural competency training for translators and interpreters that are not part of the communities they are serving and when feasible, pay providers to translate and interpret for their community. To ensure providers, care, caregivers, and families are aware of what help is out there, create a glossary and clearinghouse for language access resources. All great recommendations. Looks like Deanne just had a question in chat. Uh, have we recommended real-time translation for all webinars offered by DCYF as a matter of course? Um, I don't know if I know the answer to that. I might default to Erin if she is here still. Um, I do know that, that we are currently looking at um, or identifying gaps where we need to make sure that our information and and the webinars we provide right that that we're really um a, being accommodable for for all right whether that is 
having translation services for webinars, which I know ahead of time, that is something we can absolutely arrange for. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily like a real time where if we just have the ability to do it, um, you know, should somebody need it? I know that ahead of time with planning, we can absolutely make sure all of these are done in the in the right languages. Uh, but that does require a little bit of, of um, forward thinking, I guess, beforehand. Anybody else have anything to share regarding expanding language access? And I think what I'm hearing, Deanne, is that is a recommendation you want to make if it has not already. I don't think it's made anywhere else in this report. Yeah. So I, I just think that we, we spend a lot of time on um, translation, and I'd love for us to see interpretation more centered where uh, people who speak, speak languages other than English have direct access, just like everybody, the minute a webinar comes out, that they can hear it in their own language. Um, and it, it's so it's so possible now um, to do that. Um, and with it takes some planning and some advertising, but I think it'd be great. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, very good. Thank you. And I do know earlier, um, someone had suggested that DCYF have our website have the ability to translate into other languages with just a click. Um, I do believe that functionality is is on our site. It, it might be specific to the browser, whether you're Google Chrome or you're using Safari or, or something like that. Um, but I do know that, that that functionality is is kind of baked into DCYF's website, um, which I think is, is fantastic because it, it again it allows I mean there's hundreds I think of languages that technically could be translated with just that click of the button um so something maybe will um as as we get through the language access recommendations I think that particular item might come up a little more and I do know that's also again something that um DCYF is is working on and, and creating um a better call it digital experience that's a little more inclusive to those that are that are viewing the page. Um, and that's even something maybe as we get into the conversation about a dashboard of some sort, um, making sure that a lot of that is built into that as well. I I wanted to just, this is Aaron, by the way. Um, I, I wanted to jump in and just add to that, that um, there, we are at the beginning stages of rolling out some language access um, policies, both internally and externally as well. There's some active work groups that are going, that are um, meeting internally to start that work. I know that they, they've done a brief introduction, very brief introduction to provider supports, but I do um, anticipate this being something on the agenda for ELAC to participate in, um, in the next uh, few months at at the most. So this will be an active conversation, but I, I also think it is really good to highlight the expectations and recommendations that you, you all have going into that work. Yeah, very good. Thank you, Erin. And then as you can see at the end of this section, there is your link to that survey monkey. So as you get into this report at a later date, hopefully that should allow you the opportunity to provide feedback that you weren't here. Yes, Colleen. I see your hands raised. Yeah, Eric, on that note, um, so when someone clicks this link and then they put in those edits, can you explain what's going to happen from there with edits that folks submit? Yes, absolutely. That's a great question. So we will, um, following this meeting and, and then following many of the, I guess, the notes that Emily and I have captured and Jess even, um, that are specific to recommendations. So we will go back into the draft we will essentially update the draft with new material recommendations and clarifications. Um, that particular draft will then be distributed back to you all for further development, for you to be able then to um, add more edits or ask further questions about new recommendations or some of the languages that was, that was changed in there. Um, I don't know how quickly we will have that call it second draft out to all to you all um i think it'll be as fast as we can move um I, I i don't want to commit to a certain date but i know it will be quick obviously since we have a few other dates in mind here on the first and then the 15th 
where we're going to be diving a little deeper on this. Um, so hopefully calling that kind of answers, we'll, we'll take a lot of the feedback and edits from today. Uh, we'll incorporate those into an updated draft, and then we'll distribute that back out to you all um, for hopefully to provide edits to the version that will come in August 1st. Emily, does that sound about right? Yes, I would say my plan is probably to send, to incorporate the edits and send the draft a week or two prior to the August 1st meeting. But if you guys would like a draft in between now and that prep email, what do you guys think about that? I guess that's a question. Would you, is yeah. is getting the draft, of, the next version of the draft about a week before the August 1st ELEG meeting, is that okay? Or would you guys prefer to have two iterations of the draft in between this meeting and the next? Again, I always wonder, is my are my headphones working and everyone's talking? I'm just kidding. Um, I think that, yeah, based on our anticipation of how we were going to send that out, I think that the next one, yeah, would be would be great. I agree. Um, just to hopefully, I think our biggest one of our biggest hurdles is going to be call, call it draft confusion. So, you know, here we are working on this draft and then we send out another and that individual is maybe thinks they're working on the newer one, so so on and so forth. So I think one more would be great. And then that version we can bring in front of ELAC on August 1st um, would be technically the next. Thank you okay. for that, Eric. One other yeah. request with that, um, because I fully understand your guys's role and duty in trying to incorporate edits. And obviously you're going to have a ton of different information coming at you and not every edit can make it in there. Is it possible for you guys to share more of the raw feedback or the raw edits that were in there with folks? Because I think this kind of speaks to some of and a certain level of the gatekeeping that happens because if everybody mm -hmm. gives these edits and then it is up to a couple of individuals to do that and I am not at all saying you have intention in gatekeeping whatsoever especially in this process but rather just that it it's going to happen that somebody's edit is going to make it in and someone else's is not and so is there a way for us to share out the suggestions because I do think there's a lot of times that folks with a different perspective bring something up in a live meeting like this that is not something that I thought of when maybe giving a suggestion of my own and otherwise. So I think it would be helpful if there's a way for all of us to see what all of the suggestions were before then determining what we want to see in a final draft. Does that make yeah. sense? And I'm sure I just created a ton of work for you. Apologies. <laughs> no, okay. actually, Colleen, that's super easy to accommodate. Yeah. The survey monkeys, um, it with a click of a button, we can produce like a PDF that just lists all of the feedback. It's anonymous, of course. It's like a little survey report. So it it literally takes two seconds. So that's a great idea, by the way. Um, so yeah, we can totally do that. Yeah. Does that make call make sense, Colleen? How we'll be able to I think like along each step, you know, when we go to this next one, then all that raw data is there um, and we can provide it to you all, of course. And I think it's even great because maybe there are some something that we missed and and by, you know, you all taking a look and just identifying, making sure that those things are in there um, would be very, very helpful. So, yes, Astrid, I see you have your hand raised. Thank you. Um, let me put the hand down. I am um, as I'm looking at this, and I, I think one of the things we're we're maybe struggling with a little is that there's there's some general feedback and um that what's happening with the survey is people are telling us, you know, where they're seeing where they're seeing challenges. So I'm wondering if there's an opportunity here um before jumping into recommendations to have a little overview or some little pre like so we're on implement grants. So um, what, what's the little overview of, of that? How's that going? Um, some of the, some of the language, um, that you have here, it, it feels like, um, sort of the overview and then being really more bullet point on the, on the recommendations. So right. it's, um, but there's a little, there's a, there's a space within this report, um, to summarize, synthesize what the feedback is that we're making recommendations about. Yeah. Okay. To address. 
because right now it just feels um, it just feels like we're making recommendations, but it's not really clear where those recommendations are coming from or what the feedback I see. experience is. Does Absolutely. Yes, it does. Absolutely. Yes. Um, you know, where the, the way that the report has been developed is really contains the answer, I think, or the answers to that, um, you know, depending on if you all have been here for every one of these report development sessions, uh, you know, you might feel like you have a little more background to it because we have had, I think, for example, last time, um, Nicole and her team came in and actually kind of they provided uh, you know an update on the Fair Starts for Kids Act and a lot of those pieces contained in that presentation um, were very relevant and and then we followed that up with what more do you want to know you know like what what can we expand on um, what do you have further questions on. And, and then that kind of helped us develop into that next stage of asking for specific recommendations on the jam boards, which Emily did last time. If, I don't know for all of you that were participant in that. Um, and there was a survey involved with that before as well. And so we kind of have used those two to kind of go step by step. Um, but at the same time, I completely recognize that there is no background to this, right? It's like, here's this recommendation report, here's our recommendations, and, and there isn't um, a whole lot of fluff leading up to it. So hearing that and hearing some of your concerns, which I don't believe you are the only one that shares that concern, um, we'll make sure and give, I think, a little maybe a little more context at the beginning uh, to the steps that we got here. And, um, you know, that, for example, Nicole providing that presentation on these related items. Um, and then hopefully in some of those further rounds of edits, you all will have a little additional questions. And then, um, you know, if it's something that you feel you need more information on, then we can absolutely get that for you, right? We, we will, I mean, there are some time constraints to this and the report being done, um, but if there is information that you feel is important for you to have and um, to make these recommendations, then we want to make sure we get that to you. So it sounds like maybe um, if we were to, and this is me thinking out loud a little, um, we could share the presentation again. It was in PDF form, and this was, I think, a month or two ago. Um, it was a great little presentation, had a lot of, of, of this in it, and, and maybe with sharing that again might spark some um, some further ideas or even answer some of the questions you might have. Does anyone feel like that would be helpful to reshare that presentation? I have it up right now because it <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, that's really good. Um, you know, maybe what we can do is um, obviously if if there's items that you that you want more on, then we want to get that to you. So maybe for just ease purposes, if if anyone does feel like there's something they would like more to, then you could email the uh, DCYF, our, our community engagement team, um, or even just ourselves, and then we could of course make sure that we get that to you, and then the group as well. Um, I don't know if we have enough time to do a survey and say, hey, everybody, what, what more do you need? Um, so perhaps does anybody have any suggestions on how we can maybe get a little more background in your hands if needed? So we can definitely commit to to getting more of an introduction paragraph and having the recommendations called out more specifically in the next iteration of the draft. And maybe if there, there's like some missing information, we evaluate. Yeah, yeah that sounds but like definitely point. like Eric said, in the meantime, if there's any, I know it's like a big ask, like, hey, here's this 10 page document. What more info do you need? But, you know, right. definitely if there's anything that comes up, let us know. But but maybe if uh, we we take Astrid's feedback and. And then at the report, maybe it'll provide a little more context and point out where maybe some info is missing. Yeah, that sounds good. That sounds appropriate. And again, we're gonna we'll have a few more drafts of this, everyone. So this this will be good. Um, and we're gonna be moving pretty quickly with this too to make sure that we keep incorporating all this. 
Um, okay, well, with that, um, we can hop back into the next section, which would be implementing grants. Um, I do, it does look like we're going to be okay on time. We have about 40 minutes till the end. And um, a lot of the recommendations, there, there aren't a whole lot to some of these last sections. And so um, that might give us some time at the end to um, do a roundup. But implementing grants, recommendation is DCYF in part, thanks to the FSKA, has been able to provide, provide relief in some areas. Child care stabilization and early childhood equity grants, along with complex needs funding, has allowed many providers to remain in the workforce, promoted inclusive cultural responsive learning, and supported care for children with developmental, developmental delays, disabilities, behavioral needs, or other unique needs. The first rounds of these grants illustrated the need for community input when releasing the grants. Before grant applications go live, DCYF should connect with the community to address any concerns, to address, to measure and define stabilizing the early learning field, DCYF could analyze the rate of providers who are closing each month and track whether licensed providers have returned to pre-COVID enrollment levels. I think this is a great recommendation, and I would love to hear some of your voices on this recommendation. Yes, Enrica. Yeah, um... I'm sort of looking at the second sentence in that paragraph and just wondering, um, do we have some or can we get some? Uh, so it's the, the sentence that begins with childcare st uh, stabilization um, and early childhood equity grants. So yeah, that one. Um, and I'm just wondering, do we have or can we get some examples to, um, uh, I guess I'm sort of wondering, can we say that? or do we have examples to show that, yes, in, indeed, um, you know, we, we are, um, you know, that providers are being um, supported. And what I'm sort of reflecting on is, you know, um, you know, I take the complex needs funds. So I just wonder, are, are the complex needs funds um, truly resulting in children with developmental delays, disabilities and behavior um, needs or other unique needs, um, is it resulting in them truly um, getting, being supported? Um, or is, is something else happening that we're not aware of? So it, it's that second sentence, I just wonder whether we can say that um, without having some specific examples um, around that to support um, those, those claims. Um, if I go back to that example I gave earlier, I, I know of families who are um, who have children with um, disabilities um, who are um, struggling to gain um, access into um, programs. And so it just raises some wondering questions for me around, so what are the complex needs funds? Um, you know, what, you know, what do those support? I wonder if, I, I hear that, Enrica, and I wrote this sentence, and I think probably what I should have said, and I wonder if this reflects it better, or if we should just scratch it completely, if it should say the intent of these grants is to do those things, not that they are doing those things. I, I would agree with that. I don't want to jump ahead of Susan, who has her hand up politely, but um, I would say that anecdotally in the field, I would say it's quite the opposite where there's been such an influx of children with disabilities present in our programs. And because of the language of enrollment, at least for ECAP, children are present in these programs, but because there's not really any existing forms of support, um, whether that is transportation for children, whether that is additional staff, whether that is the materials that they need, whatever it is that um, they need to support these children and these programs, professional development, it is not existing. And I believe that that is something that is contributing to burnout with teachers and staff. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's uh, this is Susan. I would just add. So uh, I totally agree with Enrique, Enrica, uh, with what, with like, where's the evidence? Where's the data to support it? But also, it might. I don't know if this is a true statement either. 
but I believe that stabilization grants did help providers during the pandemic, uh, help them to prevent to close at that time, but we're still, we are not in economic recovery as, as a childcare sector from the pandemic, and there is more resources needed. And the concern that I have with regard to that is that the equity part, uh, using, using the um, stabilization grants as an example, well, actually all the grants throughout the system, we know that there was this, this impression that childcare centers had economies of scale, which is the reason for why we got much less money per child than family home providers. And I don't, I'm not trying to pit us against them, but I mean, that's, that is a false claim that we have economies of scale. Um, unless you're a school district or something of that level, you might have economies of scale, but the bigger our centers, the bigger our expenses. And so I would like to see further exploration of that data that says that justified the differences in what are awarded between different uh, providers like family home or family friend neighbor, whatever, to show this, uh, those economies of scale and how that was determined, because that is, is still um, a point of contention amongst many of us in the sector where we we were not supported at the level of other child care centers were not given the financial support that other programs were given and uh, per on a per child basis. So there needs to be clarity period around how those things are determined, but that there also needs to be the data to support these statements. And maybe the only thing that is true is that it did help keep providers from going out of business during the height of the pandemic. Um, I had a follow-up question for Enrica. Um, I, I really appreciate what you brought up there, but I'm, I'm, and kind of addressing what Colleen brought up in the chat. I'm trying to think about, um, what data might already be available that could possibly help. Um, I assume some of it, Colleen, I think that you're right that some of it probably is not tracked or hasn't been tracked for long enough at this point to be helpful. But um, when you, Enrico, when you when you were asking that question, were you thinking that what would it be most helpful? What are, sorry, are you looking for data to show that the money was awarded to programs for children with special needs that in that way um, we can bear, like, are you asking DCYF to verify that the funds went to programs supporting these kids? Or are you more wondering if that money within those programs is, is being effective in having an impact, if that makes sense? Uh, no, the reason for my question um, simply is, you know, if you're going to put this sentence like a sentence two in that document, um, to me, it just, um, you need data to support the claims that you're yeah. making. Mm -hmm. right. that, that's all. I'm not asking about, you know, what level, level of funding or things like that, but you're, you're, okay. making, a, you're, you're making a statement. So you, you need some data to, to back that up. Um, and I'm just really questioning whether you actually have that to back it up. Got it. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that's actually we've we've definitely made note of that. And um, I mean, there there is data there. So you know how good the data will be, we're not sure. But but we can definitely look at at creating a little more context, a little more data driven context to this particular recommendation. I think that's great. Um, along with modifying that second sentence to say, um, I think it was the intent or intended to, um, as Emily had mentioned, and I think someone in chat had actually agreed with that. So I think that changes the connotation of that sentence as well. So good job, good, really good dialogue. Um, any further questions related to this specific recommendation or further feedback? Um, I have a, a quick, I, it's, there's a thread of connection here. I'm thinking about the stabilizing the early learning field kind of component of this, um, which I know is staffing related. I know I've talked about this before, but I think that this um, entire section really relates a lot to the obligation that I feel DCYF has in connecting with OSCI 
there are, are federal mm -hmm. obligations that OSPI, um, uh, that school districts have in ensuring that children with disabilities are located and served. Um, but that is distinctly disconnected from ECAP services um, because we don't have uh, universal preschool in the US. So that's not been something that can really be considered for preschool aged children in the US. So I think we have some disconnected systems because of that um, structure that just exists. The problem is that then we have you know, providers who are kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place where you know, maybe theoretically funds exist for them to quote, support children with disabilities in the program. But the reality of how that can benefit them is starkly different because they don't hold the federal obligation of ensuring this child is receiving IDEA protected services, but the family still wants their child to attend this program. And I think there is sort of a, like DCF, DCYF will throw money at the situation, but then programs are then forced to think about what that can even look like when DCYF is not communicating with OSPI and how the structure can be reconsidered in supporting children and families. I know I'm like talking very generally because it's hard to generalize about something that is so different district to district. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, if, if there was more communication between DCYF and OSPI specifically around children with disabilities, then I think programs could be thinking more intentionally about how to use these funds and maybe less about the knee jerk reaction of, well, we just need more people in the center to support this and we can't hire anybody because there is no workforce to hire. We, it's hard for sites and centers to be finding qualified staff and hiring qualified staff and retaining qualified staff. So um, yeah. That's well said, thank you, Danny. Thanks. Anybody else have anything further to add? I think that kind of segues into the last formal recommendation here on this section uh, that child care providers should be able to apply and use funds for non ECAP slots. Allow providers who have ECAP and non ECAP slots access to apply to both. I'd love to hear a little more background on that. Um, I don't know if, if you all agree with that or if there are if the individual that made that recommendation is possibly here i'd love to hear a little more specific on that if possible or if it's just a straight up we think that we should be able to apply and here's our recommendation For those who are dying to answer but don't feel comfortable, there is a link at the end of the survey, again, or at the end of this section. Um, so as you make your edits through this draft and the further drafts, um, you'll have the opportunity to provide any more context to that, something maybe that you think of between now and then. So then we will move forward into strengthening prenatal to three supports. And we have one recommendation. And it reads, to determine what resources would be beneficial to support providers serving infants and toddlers with special needs, DCYF needs to look at funding on the whole continuum and increase the dollars coming in. Yes, Lois, please. Hey, Eric, I'm sorry. Um, was okay. doing something with the... Um, staff for a second I wanted but I was listening to Colleen's comment I think one of the things that we could possibly add to when it talks about when we think about staffing and that type of thing is we know that we can't do anything about the background check requirement and that the department is going to be sending something out to providers soon about staff having to be cleared before they can even be on site but I think that one of the things that would be helpful is being able to um, look at ways to be able to provide grants or um, some type of way for us to be able to keep folk interested um, in waiting for their clearance. 
um, prior to um, being able to access our facilities. That's number one. Number two, um, being able to, one of the things that I believe in when we talk about finding qualified staff is that having the ability, as Tom Drummond, who used to teach at North Seattle College, would say, to grow our own. So maybe even um, giving more time for some of the um, prerequisites that have to be accomplished um, so that we can have folk that are encouraging them to learn more and grow up in the field, um, but just having more time for basics or some of the other things. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Lux. Anybody have anything to add? Um, I'm sort of wondering about um, how much of this recommendation is tied to connecting with ESET um, and DCY, is DCYF considering like home visiting programs for early head starts, um, which sometimes intersects um, with ESET programming, but I know that, you know, early head start serves infants and toddlers, early ECAP serves infants and toddlers, um, and there's also existing infant and toddler care deserts um, that exist all over the state. So I'm just wondering if ESIT would be a resource to tap into just to get, um, I don't know, I guess just sort of tap into infant and toddler populations that otherwise are not necessarily accessing childcare, maybe because they don't know it's available to them. As um, I guess as a recommendation, is that what you're, could you maybe help me kind of word that a little better, Danny? That'd be great. Yeah, I think as a recommendation, because I'm, I'm just seeing, um, there's just not, there's not much in here. <laughs> right. And so I'm right. wondering if, if ESIT would be able to provide a little more substance in this area or a little more direction, knowing that they've had a huge influx of children across the state and ESIT systems. So, um, okay. yeah, just a thought. That one makes sense. I got that one. I am wondering if it would be helpful. I'm looking at the survey and the survey questions um, around this, all of these areas have a little bit more detail about like what's in this bucket. Um, and so like delivering infant and early childhood mental health consultation services is one of the area goal areas, expanding prenatal to three services and supports, including birth to three, uh, ECAP and the home parent skill-based programs. So it might be helpful just to have that pulled forward just so that we're kind of clear about what's in this, what's in the what's in the general bucket of strength and prenatal to three supports. Yeah. Okay. Do you think, Astrid, do you think that would be helpful to include in the report itself as well? Yeah, I think I think when if you think about this, it's going to be a standalone document. And if you don't have any sort of uh, like for a, for a legislator or for just someone who is picking up the report, they're not going to know where any of these recommendations are coming from if there's no right. If there's no like context. And right. so for each yeah. of these like strength and prenatal to three supports, if there was a little bit more background or context about like what's in that bucket, um, then the then the recommendations make more sense. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a great suggestion. I think, Emily, very similar to how you had done the TLS report. That was where I think each like section, there was a little bit of background on it, and then it gave the recommendation. So I think that would be really valuable for us to do here. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. We can do that, Astrid. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, that's a good one, Astrid. Thank you. Okay, and then as you all know, there's that survey monkey link at the end here. <laughs> Love to hear your feedback. Um, anything further on strength and prenatal to three supports? Okay, we will. I don't know if I have a recommendation on it, but I had a chance to be with a infant early childhood mental health consultant yesterday, and um, uh, that's working with early achievers and. 
uh, serving a whole region, one person serving a whole region with 500, five, something like 500 uh, families or in, in, the, uh, in the catchment area and just basically impossible. Yeah, wow. Yes, there is one, uh, but um, not really able to provide the supports that are needed given the, the scope. So maybe a recommendation of, of increasing funding to allow for more mental health professionals? Yeah, I think it's the work, it's a workforce issue too. And it looks like Milan had some um, something to say as well. But the, yeah, I think it's a workforce issue. There really aren't as many people trained in that. And then you have the funding issues and yeah, uh, okay. compensation issues. So there's a lot of issues. Um, yeah. But <laughs> Um, Milan, looks like you have your hand raised. Yeah, hi. Uh, can you hear me okay? Sorry about yes. that. Yeah, we can. Okay, great. Um, well, at the clinic I work at, I actually work uh, in conjunction with the WIC, the Women Infant Ch Child Program, and there's a home health nurse um, that works with the First Steps Program. So I don't know if you should include some, some I can link um, information regarding the First Steps Program uh, in the chat. But um, just to, any efforts to coordinate, kind of create a home health like setting for a lot of our families. Um, the funding can be similar for a lot of these projects. So just thought I would mention it. Well, that's great. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And we'll make sure a number of these links are also included in the follow-up afterward. We'll, we'll of course capture all these. And yes, Lois agrees. Do you guys yes. just thinking about how um, Colleen's question earlier about the where the survey results go? Would it also be helpful if we shared? We take a lot of feedback from the chat. Do you guys want the chat shared back to you with the follow up email? I don't think it would hurt. Okay, I was just thinking. I, I don't want to bombard you with documents if it's not going to be helpful. But if if that's okay with you all, it might be. We get a lot from the chat. You guys always have really good stuff in there. So yeah, yeah. I'll make a note to add that in the follow-up. Thank you. Okay, well, how about we'll hop into, I think uh, we have three more short sections uh, to get through here. And the next is expand ECAP early therapeutic and prevention services. And this was, of course, the spending goal strategy of the Fair Start for Kids Act. And your recommendations are families are often faced with difficult decisions when it comes to finding child care that is affordable and high quality. Without understanding what true high quality care looks like, parents may opt for less expensive care that is unlicensed. The department could provide more opportunities to connect with families to help them understand what early learning is and how the process can differ for alternative unlicensed care. And I'm wondering, how, what would that look like for us, for the department providing more opportunities or connecting more with families? Does anyone have any um, specific recommendations on, on how we could do that better? And that's a pretty big softball question, of course. Well, if you do think of something, um, again, the links here at the back of, of every little section. Um, so any thoughts that you may carry forward, we, we still would love to hear, hear about them. Um, next recommendation, create more contracted slots to secure access for children with special needs. Behavioral health issues are showing, showing, up, showing up early, then carry over into later childhood. DCYF and the legislature should increase support within early learning centers for providers to help address behavioral issues. Work with the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction to ensure one-on-one -on -one aids from the K-12 system follow the child to their after-school program. Anyone have any further thoughts, input? Yes, Danny. You know I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
so I think there's a few things in this. Again, I, you know, I want to call out um, the use of the term special needs um, and being really explicit and moving away from that and our, our, is what we're saying suspected and identified disabilities. Um, because if, if that's what we're talking about, I think that needs to be really clear and explicit, um, especially since, you know, identification of a disability comes with IDEA and ADA protections. So it's important to be explicit about that um, and not use a euphemism. Um, and I also want to clarify something that I know this is a conversation that we're having in various um, sectors and, and areas, but um, behavioral issues are not synonymous with disability. And I think um, sometimes that can be a, a generalized term that actually should be encompassing trauma-informed care. So at least with ECAP, Head Start programs, right, these are populations of children who are um, often experiencing trauma. Poverty is trauma. So if they're qualifying for these programs, um, that is often something that needs to be trauma-focused. So I think making a distinction between um, behavioral issues that may be rooted in trauma and um, having a diagnosed disability, which of course there's overlap um, in those areas. And I also want to point out um, too that I appreciate the line because I've been talking a lot about the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction and ensuring that there is communication across that. Um, but I also want to be really explicit in saying that um, not every child with a disability is going to need a one-on-one -on -one aid. Um, and that is not the only thing that there should be carryover on. Also, um, after school programs are not the only um, option that families are needing to access. So for example, developmental preschool, it, like I said, is often identified for children who have a diagnosed disability and qualify for services in the school district. But often what's offered is maybe two or three hours, a couple of days a week, but a family still needs a full day of childcare. So they're accessing a childcare, an ECAP program, a Head Start program, a number of programs to ensure that they have a full day of care for their child. And there does still need to be communication from that school district to that child care program, wherever it is. And that may be in the morning, maybe they attend an ECAP program from you know, eight in the morning until noon, and then they take a bus to their school district, receive two or three hours of developmental preschool time, and then take that bus back to their ECAP program. So it's not an after school program, it's a during the school day program. And that's what a lot of children are experiencing. And it is an enormous gap, like I said before, transportation for children, which is out of the hands of the provider and seemingly out of the hands of the school district because the school district is not offering transportation to a child care facility that's not within the district, even though that is the child care facility that the family needs to access to ensure that they can work. So um, having some type of consistency or carryover of transportation options for children who need to be able to access both I think is really important, but again, working with OSTI to ensure that there is any flow um, so that child care providers and LEAs or lead or local education authorities who are have those federal obligations under IDEA are working together to create an individualized plan for that family rather than the child care provider kind of being alone on an island to solve these problems that they don't have a lot of influence or power in the conversations of creating. Thank you, Danny. Would you suggest that when we use the term special needs, if we change that wording to just complex needs, would that fit that narrative a little better or is that still not doing it? I mean, I think the the risk with using any term that's not explicitly disabilities, and, I, and I'd open this up to other people as well, because I think um, there are other voices in here, but it invisibilizes disability specifically to use any euphemism that's not directly calling it out. And having a disability or being diagnosed with a disability provides access to federal protections under IDEA and ADA. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's really important not to bury the terminology of disability, but rather bring it to the forefront so that people understand that it's a protected status to have. Um, but again, I would open that up to others if anybody else has feedback. Anybody else have anything to share? 
Um, and you know, I just realized I'm gonna pop that the survey link here in chat um, because you all could have obviously had that link a long ways and you could just be typing it in and providing recommendations and edits. So uh, that is the actual link to the recommendation report draft itself. Um, so hopefully, you know, following this meeting, you don't necessarily need to wait for, for us to get that next draft out or even send some of those follow-up links. Um, you are more than welcome to use that. And that link will stay open up until um, I think we get through some of the drafts. So at least by the end of the month, I think was our plan. Is that right, Emily? I bet there's a thumbs yeah, up coming. Yeah, I think that works. <laughs> okay. Okay, excellent. Um, then how about we will, actually we did finish that one. I had to make sure we, we weren't hopping too far ahead. And I really liked seeing the, the OSPI reference in here again. Um, Clearly, there's a number of you that are that are suggesting that we um, maybe look, work a little more closely with OSPI in, in some of these elements. So we appreciate that. Um, OK, second to last section here is subsidy and making child care affordable. Uh, recommendation, we have one single recommendation. Streamline income eligibility between ECAP and Working Connections Child Care. The rate increase should go should be beyond the 85th percentile. Different subsidy streams should be braided, so they are working together to support the parent and provider. When a parent's pay increases, the family's food and housing benefits decrease. DCYF and the child care subsidy need to be aware and mindful of the tiers so they know when families will lose housing or food benefits. As we think about child care subsidies, we need to consider how other benefit programs will be impacted. That is a really good recommendation. I'm wondering, does that kind of relate to the self-sufficiency index conversation that was earlier, or are those two different things? Maybe someone could answer that for me if they know. Well, must be two different things then. Let's just pretend I didn't even ask that silly question. Um, does anyone have any further recommendations or input that they'd like to share here with the group? Oh, we're almost there. I can. I appreciate all 18 of you still hanging on here for the full three hours. Um, I think we have one last one and then we will get to a quick Mentimeter just so we can hear how you think we all we did here um, for today. So with that, I will hop into the second to last, excuse me. Um, we have expand child care licensing resources and DCYF should work with the legislature to fund incentives and develop more opportunities for local school districts and early learning communities to communicate and collaborate from an educator perspective. perspective. Partner with county or city government to have a teacher's aid navigator at local letters levels who have connections and an understanding of local early learning communities and the issues providers face. The next negotiated rulemaking with centers should be required, not an option. Dialogue needs to happen before entire WACs are managed. I'm wondering if anyone has any further context to that. And to piggyback, I also have a question if dialogue is the right word or if we should just repeat negotiated rulemaking. Um, because I I know you guys probably want to be explicit, and I'm wondering if that is not explicit enough since dialogue does not equal negotiated rulemaking. Yes, change that to okay. to negotiated rulemaking. Thanks, Susan. <laughs> okay. Well, one last one. I know I keep promising we're almost there, and I think we actually are almost, we are there. Um, last one, implement data and accountability. There should be an FSKA webpage that shows progress, timelines, and what will and will not be implemented. We need data on the amount of stabilization funds invested into each program, type broken down per license capacity, number of kids served, and by the number of early learning professionals employed at each learning facility. This will allow us to better understand that further grants need to be more equitable. Qualitative data should be included. The why needs to be part of the process to determine where and what resources are needed. 
So with that final recommendation, uh, does anyone have any further thoughts on that? I know this topic has come up a few times and we will be diving a little further into the um, dashboard, FSKA webpage dashboard conversation. Um, so there will be more to come from here. This will definitely not get lost in the fold. Um, but I'm wondering if anyone here has anything further to add to this recommendation right now. Okay. Um, Eric, just um, one thing that was brought to my attention is that we think about sharing the links to edit to the wider community. Um, it might make it a little bit more um, difficult for CE to be able to edit. And then that goes into what Colleen had mentioned, that unintentional gatekeeping. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering how this group feels about the edits actually coming, the survey going out to the community, but the actual document edits come just from ELAC since we're the ones responsible for um, this report. What are what's everyone's thoughts? Low, so my only question, I, I clicked on the survey and it's asking questions about different things, um, you know, in the report. Can people actually complete the survey uh, um, intelligently or with, you know, with good recommendations if they haven't read the report? Probably not, unless they have. Uh, oh, sorry to answer that, but I'm, I'm because I chip waited for you to answer, Lois. Sorry about that. Um, I, I would think that really that the context would be needed for for someone to provide really good response into into any survey. Um, and I think when this was sent out, I think what's great maybe is you know in this in this report itself the links are embedded in there. So you almost have to be reading this in order to respond. Um, whereas, you know, throwing the link here in the chat, obviously anyone can open it up and then here they're like, well, what do you want me to do? You know, you want me to provide edits to what, you know? So I understand that, right? I recognize that, Susan, that it's not necessarily very clear. So then Lois, I think you're right that the, if we're gonna, I think we don't send the link out to the broader community for the edits part necessarily, but if they receive the edited version, the, the one iteration, I guess, that's gonna come out after the ELAC feedback is given and incorporated, um, because that's my concern is, which report would we have them read before they complete the survey? And it sounds like mm -hmm. they people need to really read the edited one in order to complete the survey in a way that is most helpful for the final version. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah it, does. it does. So are we are we actually talking about two surveys then? Because um, I was referring to the survey that's open until the 26th. So, um, and I agree with you, Susan, I think reading the edited draft for the second survey makes sense to me. But um, not sending out the links to the broader community, I think that would just, um, that would be too much and just kind of, muddy things yeah. i think that makes i think that's clear to us emily does that make sense to you yeah so with the follow-up email that goes to elac the coalition that will have this draft report with the link to edit the to provide edits to the draft report and then to to just to confuse you guys simultaneously we also <laughs> have the survey um, going out to the wider community, as many people as we can get to provide context for ELAC to make recommendations. So the there's there's the survey that's going to go just to ELAC and the coalition to provide edits to this um, report. And then we also have the survey that goes to the wider community that is asking for their input on how they have been impacted or not impacted by the Fair Start for Kids Act spending goals and strategies. We'll try to make that very clear in the follow-up email too. Yeah, yeah. 
Got a lot of surveys. Um, okay, well, we hit our noon time here. And uh, before we throw, let me get rid of my share screen here. You don't need to be. Oh, you already did. Oh, good job. Thank you. Um, great. Thank you, Jess. Jess has thrown in a Mentimeter into the chat. And we would love to hear if you have any additional comments or questions on today's topic. Um, verbally, I think, is appropriate as well. Yes. And we will we'll hold on for the um, the Zoom here for a few minutes to give you all the opportunity to to answer this final comments here at the end. Um, this does really help us, so we appreciate you know good and bad um, for us to to get a little better at this. So especially for myself. So. But I, I do appreciate everyone being here and, and hanging on to the end and, and accepting the somewhat bumpy ride. But I do believe that, you know, the next few drafts as we get through this, that you all have a really good opportunity to provide some solid recommendations to a foundation that's already been created. And then now you're going to hopefully be able to kind of massage that a little bit further. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Milan. As you all are um, finished with the Menti, then you are more than welcome to head out for your day. Um, I think we do have a few closing remarks. Um, the next public meeting, as you all may remember, is August 1st. And then we have the another special meeting, which will be an executive session for report development on August 15th. Um, we will have the next iteration of draft out along with some of the other links and everything as we mentioned out to you all as quick as we can. Uh, but with that, does anyone have any closing comments, questions, concerns? If not, we will bid you all adieu, which I think means goodbye in French, I'm not sure. Thank you guys so much for your time. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Eric. Thank you all. Thank you everyone.